And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Chef Canarsi. Yo, Lord willing, Jeff Canarsi, Mob Talk Radio, check it out. Yo, we stay quiet, like Russell Buffalino, when things will get ugly like Pessy's death in Casino. Who do we know? No one, nobody. But we're all well respected like Della Croce and Gotti. I know wild nights, Havana not turn. Light up a cigar and watch your spot burn. You'll get patty whacked, I'm tough like Irish dock workers. Rubber guys, rubber guys, hooligans and black lurkers. Corner berserkers, street savvy soldiers. You owe, you better pay. Don't make me say I told you. Cold you don't portray, I say what I mean. Providence and Brooklyn all the way to the bean. I'd rather be unseen, like Benny the Chin. I don't gotta go to Vegas to see cities of sin. Pull the pin, drop bombs like Danny Green I write homicide like the murder machine Lansky Luciano, mastermind the racket Up in the clam house with a million in my jacket Move around when the streets get darker Pay homage to real bosses like Gambino and Patriarcha Mob talking, but you don't talk to the mob Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi, we stay on our job This is Mob Talk, straight from the streets Mob Talk, the life of a beast Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi, bringing you the and welcome to Mob Talk Radio. I am your host, Jeff Canarsi. We've got a big one this week. We're going to do a Q&A, followed by Tony Spilatro. A lot of people have been asking for that. I believe I actually did this show before, but I think that it was probably three years ago. Uh, so this one should be a little better. It's, a, it's, it's pretty in-depth as far as that goes. Uh, not a lot to really report. I don't want to start no beefs this week. I'm a little tired of the arguments with, with jerk offs. So, uh, all that being said, uh, pretty much the one thing I'm going to discuss here at the opening very quickly, and then we'll cut to a break and then come back and start the show is the paintings. A lot of people have been asking about the, the mob talk radio paintings. Uh, we've got 30 or 40 different ones. And I think probably next week or the week after, uh, we're going to start launching the, the sale for them. Uh, as far as this week goes, we're going to do this show. Then I'm going to take a week off. And in between uh, this week and when we come back is when I'm sort of going to figure out uh, how we're going to do the, the, the painting stuff. Uh, but basically, it's going to be very simple. Uh, one price, one size, just to keep it basic. Maybe two sizes, two prices. Uh, and everything will be taken care of the way it needs to. So we're going to start launching and bringing those out probably in the next two weeks. I, I can't imagine we're going to wait much longer than that. A lot of people have been messaging me. Uh, if you're interested in custom stuff, let me know. Uh, just send me a, a, a private message and we can talk. Uh, but basically, uh, I'm, I'm not sure totally how I'm going to do this yet, but as soon as, you know, we get a little further down the road and I know exactly how I'm going to present it, then, then we'll go from there. But that is definitely going to happen in the next two weeks, three weeks, the latest. Uh, and it'll be very easy. It takes a week to get the stuff. Uh, shipping and handling is uh, going to be included in the price, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, everything is really custom custom made to begin with uh you're not going to be able to find this stuff anywhere so we'll launch that in the next two or three weeks uh but other than that things are very quiet and calm the way i want not a whole lot coming out of philadelphia i know a lot of people have been messaging me about that listen no news is good news in a lot of cases and i think that specifically i've been trying to look into the jersey drug case and there's just really nothing to find so i i think it's safe to say, and I could be wrong, but it's just my opinion. I, I think that what's going on specifically in the Jersey situation is that there's obviously still more investigating going on. I think if there wasn't, you'd have seen the trial move ahead already and all of that kind of good stuff. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that there's still uh, things going on, still things in the mix. Uh, there are still people talking from what I understand. Uh, I don't want to get into sort of the logistics of all of that uh nor do i want to put a moniker on on anybody's fucking name who doesn't deserve that so that's one of the reasons why when people come to me and say tell me the name tell me the name i don't because i wouldn't want somebody putting that moniker on my name especially like if i'm living in a, a, a fairly small area I, I wouldn't want to deal with the retribution of that so that's why i don't but uh other than that that's pretty much where we stand uh, I think the only thing I'm really going to mention really quick, too, and I, I, I swore to God I wasn't going to do this, uh, but apparently, uh, and listen, let me let me make this clear. 
I really don't give a fuck. I really don't. People are going to talk. People are going to run their mouth. People are going to say all kinds of stuff. They always do. They always have. Uh, Social media is designed in a way for gutless cowards to run their mouths and say shit they would never say to you in person. Uh, That being said, uh, there was there's some shit apparently and it was brought to my attention by people that listen to my show. People that don't really know me. They have no vested interest to uh, make up shit, come to me and, and tell me a bunch of nonsense. But. Uh, I was I was thinking of my father the other day who passed away in 2004, God rest his soul, and I had posted a couple photos and people made some smart-ass comments calling him Tony DeRoach Rampino, which is disgusting and vile. I don't think it's funny, uh, but people are assholes and they're just going to do what they're going to do. However, there seems to be this thing going around that my father was a mob guy, my father broke legs. L- let me explain this. My father was a Navy vet. Uh, he was in Vietnam, Bronze Star, Silver Star recipient, uh, a fucking war hero, a good man, uh, never broke a law in his life, just very straight up Irish guy. Uh, so I don't understand where this rumor and gossip is coming from. Now, it could be coming from a couple of places. First of all, there's a couple of, um, I think a couple of websites, right? Uh, I, I'm not going to mention them by name, mainly because I don't want to give them any glory. But there's there's two specific ones. One is run by the FBI. People don't know that. And they go in there and they spew all this fucking nonsense about what's going on in the streets, what, they've, what they're what they hearing. But they don't understand it's run by the fucking federal government. The website is run by the federal fucking government under a guise of a different name. And so basically, you guys are all talking about being stand-up fucking guys and you're going to this website you're talking about street shit corner store rumors and shit you're nothing but fucking rats because you don't realize where the fuck you're saying this shit you're saying it on a fucking website that is bankrolled by the fbi it's not a conspiracy theory it's a fucking fact so keep spouting your fucking nonsense in there and you wonder where all the heat's coming from it's coming from people that have an opinion that don't know shit and they're going to go in there and talk all this shit like they're a tough guy and they wonder why everybody gets arrested and why the fbi starts looking here and there that's why i don't go in chat rooms like that i see what they say about me in all these places i don't give a shit but where i kind of draw the fucking line here is when it comes to my father uh he don't deserve that uh he died in in 2004 he's not here to defend himself if you want to attack me go right ahead and attack me leave my family to fuck out of it uh they never do they 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 get a two-bit piece of shit information from somewhere that's not even fucking accurate and they say all this crazy shit now A lot of people have said to me, why do you let that bother you? I really don't at the end of the day. I'm not going to lose sleep over it, but I'm sensitive about certain things, right? So you attack my my relatives, my nieces, my nephews, this person, that person. I get a little pissed off because you don't have to like me. You don't have to like me, but you got to draw a line somewhere. I, I may not like... Uh, this person or that person, but I'm not going to attack their daughter. I'm not going to attack their children. Uh, It's just there's no point for me to do that. I'm not going to prove my point by pointing out somebody's kid's a fucking crackhead or anything like that. Uh, I sort of take it to to the source of the information, the perpetrator. That's the way I've always been. That's the way I always will be. People don't like it. I get it. They think I got a big mouth, but I'm going to say this for the record. They won't say it to me. I guarantee you that. Uh, B, you know, enough of the bullshit, enough of the rumors. I go where I want, do what I want. I'm not hiding from nobody. I never have. I never will. It's not, there's no heat like that. People want to make up kind of shit. But when you start talking about my father and you say things that are just so fucking mind boggling, fucking retarded, like I don't understand it. What are you trying to prove? Do you want to get your fucking teeth pushed through the back of your fucking head? Like, because that's the result. And the thing is, is you don't, uh, this isn't a threat for me. What I'm saying to you is you apparently never learned to just be quiet because the people that talk the most shit, eventually that karma will catch up to them. Uh, I don't think any of the people that are saying this kind of shit are going to go anywhere where there's tough guys and going to open their mouths. It's easy to do it from behind a computer screen. Or from your mother's basement or wherever the fuck you live. So I don't really get that particularly upset about it. But the point is, is at some point, get a fucking job. Find a hobby. Quit pretending to be fucking Tony Sirico from The Sopranos. 
Stop buying the fucking Fugazi fucking gold-plated chains, the gold-plated pinky rings. Stop buying the fucking costume that you think gangsters wear and fucking go get a job. I know somebody. You don't know anybody. That's the truth. If you, if you know anybody, why do you have to tell anybody you know anybody? Knowing somebody, and I've said this a hundred times, does not make... Uh, knowing uh, Joey the Mook and whoever Jimmy Bag of Fish Sticks or whatever the fuck it is, just because you know somebody does not make you tough. That makes you a pussy. And the reason why that makes you a fucking pussy is because that's the first fucking line you're going to use after you run your mouth about somebody and they approach you. Oh, I know somebody. Don't fuck with me. Fuck you. You were so tough. You don't you, listen. People live off reputations. I say that all the time and I always will. If your reputation precedes you, meaning that people that grew up with you in the neighborhood, no, you're not the one. Not to test you, not to push you, not to put you in a corner. If people know that, that reputation precedes you. You don't have to say a fucking word. Who you fucking know doesn't mean shit to me. Never has, never fucking will. And for the ones that keep saying this shit, oh, I know this guy, I know that guy. Apparently you don't. Apparently you don't. You just, you don't. Who do you know? You watch Goodfellas, you watch Sopranos, you think you know fucking all these people, you think you understand mob politics, you think you understand how the street works, you watch fucking three episodes of fucking Narcos, you think you can sell a fucking kilo of coke, you think you know it all. Meanwhile, the first cartel guy that comes to see you, you're going to shit your pants and run to the FBI and tell on everybody, because you're weak. And that's the way that, that's the way that social media fucking unfortunately operates. Uh, I've seen it, it's been done to me for fucking three years now nothing ever surprises me and i know that there's like three guys that are really behind this four guys so i i know all five guys that are behind this so i'm not stupid uh but then i also have to weigh my options of like are they is it worth it are they really going to come to me and say any of that and they're not uh you know so it, at the end of the day while i appreciate that people are coming to me and telling me that this is being said in this chat room and that chat room just don't do it no more i don't care uh unless they're going to be man enough to come say it to me th then they're, they're just pussies and and that's the reality of it and you know what i don't have to defend my father he was a good guy he was a stand-up guy uh, he's a tough guy but he wasn't a criminal he was a good man and the fact that that people will go so far to get attention because mommy and daddy never hugged them or maybe mommy or daddy hugged them a little too much uh, and paid all their bills their whole life. Uh, maybe that's why they feel like they can they can come out and do it. So I don't listen. I don't sweat it. And I know other people are getting upset because they like me and they want to defend me. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time because let me tell you what's going to happen. And this is the truth. If any one of these guys remotely said that to me, I'm going to react to them. And then guess what's going to happen to me? I'm going to go to jail. And I'm going to go to jail because they're going to run and tell the police. Because that's the type of people we're dealing with. A stand-up guy doesn't need to tell you through a Facebook message everybody he knows. That's a rat move. What do you care who the fuck you know? Just because you know somebody, is that going to get anything done? No, be a man and handle it yourself. You know, that's, that's this, this idea that you need a, a, a fucking gang mentality, to somebody to defend you. Either you're tough or you're a pussy. Which one is it? So all that being said, while I appreciate people telling me, really at the end of the day, I got a million other things that are more pressing than that. Uh, and, and I'm of the philosophy, if you have something to say, say it to me. You got the same six guys that are behind this kind of stuff, all on computers saying it. Then there's another guy that says shit behind my back all the time. And, and it just, I don't care. I don't care. They lack the fucking courage to say it to me. And that's who they are at their core. They're weak. So, I, listen, I appreciate it. But let's just let, let sleeping dogs lie. Uh, I, I think it's just better for everybody. Uh, people are jealous. People are envious. Uh, and, and this is what I always tell people who don't like my show and who want to correct me on every little fucking thing. If you think you're so good at it, do it yourself. They never do. I always offer them. I say, you want to come on the show and debate me live? They never want to do it. I will give the world's biggest fucking creep show loser, cock sucking piece of shit there is. I will give him an outlet and I will put him on my show live and all the shit that he's spewing out in the public about me, let him come on my show and talk to me. They won't do it. None of them will do it. So why is that? If you if if you got the balls to say it on the internet, you should you should say it to me on the air. But they won't because they know how I'm going to react and they know I'm going to bury them. 
and, and that's 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 how I operate. Uh, anything that I say here, I'll say in public. Ask anybody who knows me. Uh, I don't need to prove who I am, what I am, all that shit. It's just it's fucking nonsense. Uh, and, and other people need to just ignore them because really, at the end of the day, they're looking for attention any way possible they can get it. Uh, because I, apparently they didn't get it as a kid. I don't know. But anyway, all that being said, we're going to take a break. We come back with get to the Q&A, followed by Tony Spilatro. In my travels, I'm always looking for a clothing brand that I feel like represents me. Anybody can go to a store and buy a t-shirt with a gimmick. But if you believe in three core values like I do, loyalty, honor, and respect, then look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. You can catch them at Omerta Mia dot com o m e r t a m i a dot com with locations in europe california boston brooklyn florida pennsylvania and washington they have a great clothing line with hats shirts sweatshirts keychains anything you might need stickers you want the rats to stop snitching go right out and get yourself a sticker but if you want to live your life by the gentleman's code look no further than omerta brand clothing and welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. Per the usual, we're going to do a Q&A. I think I have like close to 30, 35, 36 questions, maybe a little shorter. Uh, listen, I get 60 questions. I just kind of got to pick the best ones that I can go with for the week. Uh, as usual, you can follow us on Twitter at Real Mob Talk 7. Check us out on Facebook. Type in Mob Talk Radio. You can submit to the Q&A by sending me a personal message or under a post on uh, Facebook. I'll put in, you know, Q&A, drop your questions. You can do it there. Or you can message me, direct message me on Twitter or hit me up on Twitter either way. There's a million different ways that you can get it in. Uh, and like I said earlier in the show, next week we are going to take a week off. I need a week off from this nonsense. I, I can't do this 24-7 sometimes. I, you know, I need a break. So all that being said, per the usual, if I did not get to your question, it's not because I don't have the answer. It's probably because it's been answered a million times. And we have a bunch of people on the the actual Facebook itself that will jump in and chime in and answer questions. Most of the time, they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. But if it's a simple question, I don't mind somebody else answering it. I really don't. All right. So all that being said, we are going to get to the questions. Once again, these are in random order. I'm no, I no longer include the names uh, in these questions just because I think that people would rather be a little bit anonymous. Okay. First question. I don't know if anybody has ever asked you this, but if you ever thought of becoming a mobster or involved in that kind of life, because based on your knowledge on this and your interest as well as your last name, have you ever given some thought or could you think of possibility uh, the possibility of how good a gangster you might actually be? Uh, how to answer this? Well, my last name is not Canarsie. Uh, people that think that that's my last name are definitely uh, wrong. That is not my last name. Uh, I've been pretty clear about who I am, who I'm related to in the past with certain people. So we're going to leave it at that. Did I ever think of being a gangster? Sure, of course. I think when you grow up uh, in a certain area, certain part of a family and, and people are doing stuff, I think that there is some truth and validity to growing up seeing the money, the big houses, the cars, the women's and all that. I think that that sort of propels you to want to have those things but i think that there are two types of people there are people that can do that and people that can't do that did i try it absolutely of course i i don't lie about my past i don't need to inflate my past uh, i got in a lot of trouble at a young age uh looked at some serious some serious fucking time uh and so it was kind of like one and done and, and when i say one and done meaning you know you go out you try to do something and uh you get caught and and the, the reality is and i've always been honest about this and i will continue to be is that what i got caught for uh and what i pled guilty to I, you know what for me it was an easy decision uh 27 years or fucking probation uh what are you gonna do didn't rat anybody out didn't need to rat anybody out just took a plea deal signed the paperwork and off i went uh, with a shitload of probation, a ton of fines. But I've always reconciled this, and, and I'm sure my attorney would tell me this is the stupidest thing you could say, but I really don't give a shit because it's all uh, water over the dam now. But if that's the one thing that I got caught for out of everything that I did, believe me, it was worth fucking pleading out to that because there's other stuff in my past that, that I may have done or been involved in that could have put me away for a lot longer than 20, 22 years or whatever the fuck it was at the end of the day. I think realistically it was uh, 
two charges, ten and a half a piece. Uh, so it was like it was like twenty something, and then it got reduced and all that bullshit. You know how they do reduced concurrent. You know, six and a half, seven years a piece. So uh, ultimately, uh, you know, I got lucky. A judge felt bad for me. Uh, that's the reality of it. I probably should have done prison time. I'm the first to admit that I probably should have gone away for a long time. Uh, but that's that's uh, that's sort of the reality of it. But if that's the, the charge and the pinch I got to take, even though I wasn't, if you looked at the charges themselves, I really was, I was involved in it, but not to the extent that, uh, the state at the time had said I was, but you know what? The reality of it is, uh, the way that the system works is that if you know about something and you don't go tell the police immediately, they charge you with it too. Uh, I, I was involved, but not as deep as, uh, they made accusations of, uh, and, and making me the leader of some sort of, uh, organized thing was just a joke, but, Reality is, is no, I, I passed past that incident. No, I, I didn't have any desire for it. I, I don't think that, uh, listen, whatever people want to do what they want to do. But I just think for me, one and out like that and getting that much time, I, I think the writing was on the wall for me. So now I don't really think about it at all. And just because I have an interest or I, I know things because I grew up in a certain kind of way and around certain people doesn't make me any smarter than the average bear. It just means that that I can see it from from multiple angles and uh, very few people like are able to retire in that lifestyle and never do a day day, day in prison uh, and very few die on their own beds. So, I mean, there's there's a pro and a con to that. But no, for for the most part, no, I think that after my incident, I think I sort of, uh, you know, after the fact, I, the FBI did raid, raid my house uh, probably two years after these criminal charges. Uh, and I've I've spoken about that at length and what happened there. So yeah, you know I'm I'm very familiar with law enforcement, uh, not necessarily in a good way, uh, but I think that after getting charges like that, and then the FBI kicked in my doors and went crazy with that kind of nonsense. That was I think that was enough for me. You know, but that's just me. All right, Thomas Dewey, why did he have it out for Lucky Luciano and a couple of others? I have read that the sentence that Lucky Luciano got for pandering was the largest anyone ever received for that charge. I am curious. It seemed very personal. Uh, Thomas Dewey did a lot of fucked up things. Uh, he definitely didn't like Italians. He definitely didn't like Jews. Uh, and the reason why I can say that is because you got to look at who he prosecuted, how he prosecuted uh, one of the more interesting things is the way he fucked Luciano, but it really what's more egregious than that is what he did to Chuck the Bug Workman. Uh, Workman was a Jewish hitman, and he was insanely respected uh, amongst his peer group, which included Meyer Lansky, Albert Anastasia, Gypt Carlo, and Lucky Luciano. Uh, Workman was actually indicted in New York, but it was moved to New Jersey. Uh, and Tommy Dewey is prosecuted, which at the time is illegal, considering that Thomas Dewey did not have jurisdiction to practice in New Jersey. So how does Tommy do De Thomas Dewey end up a prosecutor in a whole nother fucking state where he isn't certified to work? It's garbage and it's nonsense. Uh, also, Workman refused uh, Workman received a huge sentence. Uh, it was kept longer in prison than he was actually supposed to because Dewey kept using prosecution to force pressure on Workman to talk or sit in jail. Talk or sit in jail. Uh, Workman probably served twice the time that anyone else would have under those circumstances. And his parole, every parole hearing for like 14 years, he got fucked. And that shouldn't have been the case. Uh, he was a model prisoner. He was a leader in the prisoner, et cetera, et cetera. But once again, it was Thomas Dewey didn't get what he wanted, so he was going to try to fuck as many people as he could. Uh, look at what he did to Luciano, made promises, and then had him deported. So uh, really, you have to look at it in, in the scope of how did Thomas Dewey practice law in New Jersey? Like, it doesn't make any sense. So there you go. Um who really, if known, set up the Appalachian meeting of 1957? One documentary says Genovese did, and the other say Stefano Magadino. Which one? Uh, Genovese was the one who called the meeting. Uh, he's the one that wanted to have the meeting. Now, is he the guy that made all the calls and had them all showed up? Probably not. Um, but Genovese wanted it. He wanted to be recognized as a boss. He wanted Carl Gambino to be recognized as boss of the Gambino crime family. There was drugs. There were all kinds of issues that were going into this. Uh, but who specifically made the call? I really couldn't tell you. 
Uh, I can only really tell you, I, like I said, if if I wasn't there and I'm not privy to the, to, to guy A telling guy B, then then really all I'm doing is being circumspect. Uh, a lot of authors do that. A lot of bloggers do that. A lot of journalists do that. They don't really know, and they sort of try to uh, talk to you as if they were actually there. Now, I do that as well, but the difference is, is I have sources that can connect the dots. So if I can connect the dots and give you a plausible reason for why it happened this way, then that's what I'll do. Does that mean that I'm 100% right all the time? Absolutely goddamn not. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I couldn't tell you who's the one that said, yes, let's have a fucking meeting. But I think realistically speaking, if you think about the politics of it, it had to come from the commission. They're the ones that had to have said, yeah, we're going to do this. So there you go. All right. Did uh, Frank Costello transfer his political connections before he was more or less shelved or did he take them uh, with him into his involuntary retirement? Uh, he, you know what, when Frank Costello, that, that was really a very big change for the mafia, especially in those days, because Frank Costello really fucking owned politicians. Uh, even if you go back into history to Tammany Hall, uh, criminal fringe groups always controlled Tammany Hall in New York. That's how you got shit done. Uh, if you're looking at like the, the movie, the gangs in New York with Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, you look at the, the seven points gang, Tammany Hall was really sort of the the head of the snake so to speak uh with with political power and with criminality and political power combined and so what we see with costello is that he was just able to schmooze politicians and he was able to get things done in a way uh he still had political connection connections but I think the thing is, is once he was effectively shelved, he sort of acted in a, a conciliatory kind of way with the mafia. He was never totally, totally shelved. He still had connections, still did things, still made money, but he was never what he was. Uh, and he didn't necessarily take those political connections with him, but the political connections no longer had a need for him uh, because he no longer had that much juice, so to speak. So uh, in, in part, I would say, yeah, half 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 he took them with him uh but what would he need them for at that point anyway he sort of became a socialite after he was retired uh and that's sort of the way it went but that changed the landscape of the mafia we've talked about chicago a lot on this show specifically and i want to say hello to uh joey lombardo in chicago at the cigar spot good guy stand-up guy good friend of mine wanted to make sure i said hello to him and all the boys at the uh cigar spot in chicago uh, but it's like Chicago in the sense that uh, once Giancana and they lost the political machine, the landscape changed. And there was a lot that happened in a relatively short period of time uh, to Chicago specifically when, when they lost the political power. All right. Personal thoughts on Johnny Roselli. Um, you know, I like I like Johnny Roselli's story. It's a, it's a good story, and I always thought that that would make like a really interesting movie. But a lot of people just aren't fond of him, and there's a lot of reason a lot of reasons why. And I, and I don't want to go into a huge biographical uh, dissertation on Johnny Roselli, but you know, he was out in Hollywood. He was in Chicago. Uh, he ultimately gets involved with Brian Foy, who owned the uh, who owned a, a film company called Eagle Lion Studios, which made actual uh produced gangster films so if you look at some of the earlier gangster films that were popular you'll see johnny roselli's name uh he was helping funnel money into that and it also gave him kind of a job that would sort of allow him to bypass what he actually did um but working for eagle lion studios would actually enable him to move deeper into filmmaking uh, and would really give him an opportunity to kind of shake down the industry. Uh, he would take over the theatrical stage employees union. Uh, he would be arrested for indicting and rac uh, he would be indicted for racketeering. He would end up serving 10 years, but he would he was sentenced to 10 years, but released in three. Uh, it was through Murray, the Camel Humphreys that he got out early. Humphreys would use his political power. Uh, with Tom C. Clark, who was Harry S. Truman's bagman to get Roselli and others out early um roselli also had a part 
and helping Harry Kahn obtain Columbia Pictures by using Mafia slush funds for the financing and power via Johnny Roselli and Tony Accardo. Uh, Roselli would eventually be sent out to Vegas as the mob's representative in Vegas, and his job was basically pretty simple. He was there to ensure, ensure that Chicago got their fair share of the skim. Uh, but to skirt the law, at least on paper, Roselli was employed with Monogram Studios as a movie producer. Uh, perhaps Roselli's most noted issue came from the idea of or the incident of, I think it was Operation Mongoose killing a Fidel Castro. Uh, we know why the mob wanted Castro dead. It's, it's very simple, very effective, and we know why the United States wanted him dead. We also know that the CIA went to the mafia for help. It was through Johnny Roselli, <coughs> excuse me, that the government uh, made contact with the mafia through Johnny Roselli. Roselli's contact was Roger Mayhew, uh, who pretended to be an offshore uh, international corporation who was upset with losing millions of dollars at the hands of the shit that Fidel Castro did. But Roselli knew different, uh, and Roselli knew that he was an ex-FBI and CIA operator. And it was also through Roselli that Mayhew met Sam Giancano, excuse me, Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante. Uh, there were also, there were various scenarios and various uh, plots to kill Fidel Castro, uh, but it was really Roselli was, was sort of the point man for all that. He actually had a secret training area down on the Florida Keys where snipers and those partaking in the mission uh, to kill Fidel Castro were trained. And then sort of 1975 happens, and what happens in 75 to Roselli is that he ends up having to testify before the U.S. Senate Committee on Intelligence led by Idaho Senator Frank Church. The topic was the CIA's plan to kill Castro and the operation dubbed, obviously, Operation Mongoose. Uh, right after Roselli testifies, Sam Giancana gets killed by Tony Spilatro and a couple of others. Uh, we can't really get down to exactly who did it. I wasn't there. Uh, but that seems to be that the way the story goes. Um it's long been asserted uh, that the mob was a little worried about Sam Giancana, uh, but the must, much bigger issue at hand wasn't really the Castro plot. I don't think the mafia was concerned that the CIA was working with the, the, the mafia to kill Castro. I don't really think that that's what scared the mob. I think it was more the John F. Kennedy situation which terrified them. Uh, the hit on Giancana was enough to rattle Roselli, and he ends up fleeing to Florida. In 1976, Roselli was called to speak before the committee to testify about the conspiracy to kill John F. Kennedy. Three months after his first round of testimony, the committee wanted to recall Roselli, uh, but he ends up going missing. Roselli would ultimately be found in a 55-gallon drum floating off Biscayne Bay. Uh, the government has alleged that the mob killed Johnny Roselli for not giving Chicago its money from Vegas, but reality is I don't really believe that to be the case. I think that uh, ultimately, at the the end of the day, I think that Johnny Roselli just knew too much. He just knew too much about situations. He knew too much about politics. He knew too much about Kennedy because he was also the point man uh, in the Kennedy thing, if you choose to believe that. History has told us that Roselli was the front for the plot to kill Kennedy. Working closely closely with Zapata Oil, which was a front oil company owned and operated and oversaw by George Bush, uh, who at the time uh, of the Kennedy hit was the head of the CIA. George Bush has long denied that he was ever in Dealey Plaza. He was uh, long uh, said that he was never in Dallas when the Kennedy was killed. But yet there have been pictures that have come out that that show uh, George Bush there standing outside the hospital. So, you know, you got to be careful, like how much of a conspiracy you're going to believe. But for years, he said he wasn't there, but photos prove he was. So that sort of lends itself to believe some other things. Uh, George Bush also had direct contact with Johnny Roselli, and it's widely believed that it was through Roselli that the CIA met Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, so, you know, Roselli was good for the mob in a lot of ways, but he was bad for the mob because he saw and knew too much. And ultimately, I, I think that's why Roselli gets killed. They're just, I don't think they're concerned with the fucking Fidel Castro bullshit because uh, he could blame that on the government. They're more concerned with the Kennedy stuff. And I think that was more of a, an issue there. All right.
why did Cleveland put out a hit on Ray Ferrito after he got rid of the biggest problem in Cleveland by, excuse me, by killing Danny Green? Uh, simple. Ferrito was sloppy. Uh, the Cleveland mob, look, they didn't want any attachments. At least like Ivoli didn't want any attachments. Uh, the, the fact that Ferrito left paperwork uh, from a bomb car, which came as a result of a search warrant from the Erie police. Uh, Ferrito had been involved in too much shit, been involved in too many bombings. He knew too much. Uh, Lacavoli was not going to risk getting arrested because of Ferrito, and that should tell you why that they killed him. Uh, unfortunately, he should have killed him a lot sooner because Ferrito ends up becoming a government uh, informant as a result, and they all go to prison, all go away to prison for a long time. So uh, ultimately, we've seen this historically, is that guys typically wait too long to react. So he wasn't killed because... You know, he did not He did them a lot of favors, but you get involved in so much stuff and then you you leave shit laying around your house that gets everybody indicted or could get everybody indicted or gives the guys that you may talk because you've got this impending doom coming against you. That's why it happens. And that particular situation is why it happens. Okay. What do you make of the claims made by Metro Commander Kent Clifford when he said that Tony Spilatro put an unsanctioned hit out on one of his men? He claims that Tony Spilatro demanded to meet him after he was warned to call off the hit, and him and Kent went nose to nose and Spilatro backed down. What's your opinion? One, I don't believe it, because let me explain something. If that really went down, why Tony Spilatro would have been taken off the streets in a second. Any mob guy threatens to kill a cop, any mob guy threatens to hurt a cop, FBI agent, whatever, they're going to be arrested immediately. Uh, the FBI, the CIA, Metro cops, they're not going to put up that shit. Uh, there may be some truth to Tony Spilatro wanted him dead. Uh, but the idea that a cop confronted Tony Spilatro and he backed down, I just don't buy it. I think that that's bravado to sell books. That's just my opinion. All right. Where does Eddie Boyle stack up against other Irish gangsters? Uh, if you don't know who Eddie Boyle is, go ahead and look him up. I don't want to do a biography on him, but I'm going to tell you something. Had Eddie Boyle been been uh, had a bigger or a longer run, I think he's up there with the likes of Jimmy Burke. Uh, Boyle was a Gambino associate. He was a killer. He was an earner. He ran with Frank. He ran around with Frank and Jimmy Heidel, amongst others, including Lenny DiCarlo and Thomas Dono. Uh, and was even allegedly uh, one of Madonna's uh, fuck boys, whatever you want to call it. But look up that information for yourself. But yeah, I think if the if Eddie Boyle had had a longer run, uh, I think at the end of the day, yeah, he could have rivaled Jimmy Burke and some other guys, but a uh, different time period as well. All right. Uh, in the history of the mafia, has anybody ever been able to officially retire due to old age? Uh, or with to re, to, or to go away without any hard feelings or bad blood. Absolutely. This is one of the myths that I think society or mob uh, fans don't understand. Uh, who said you could never leave the mafia? Like, I want somebody to, like, show me where any gangster has ever said, nope, you can't leave the mafia. Uh, that's not true. Guys leave all the time. Guys, you know, once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, they're, all of this stuff was started from movies and lore and, and bullshit and, and legends and myths. None of that's true. Uh, I know I know people that have left that life, uh, and they go about their business. Uh, some, You know, it depends also, too. you got to look at the time period, right? In the 60s, you might have had a – probably had a harder time doing that. Uh, but it depends on how much you know, how much you're involved in, how much you've done. Uh, if you're just a simple fucking earner, who the fuck's going to care? You leave, they're going to take over your rackets, and you're done. It's as simple as that. So, yes, people have been able to retire. People have been able to, to leave with no problems, uh, leave in good standing. Uh, but the reality is, is that all of this stuff has been started from fake books. It's been started from fucking fake movies. The Godfather is the worst fucking example of that lifestyle. Uh, that is that lifestyle on steroids. That is that lifestyle. It, that's an operatic fairy tale. Uh, there have been things that have been taken from history that were put in that film that were good, but the, the just the regal shit and the pageantry of it all, uh, is, it's nonsense. Goodfellas is closer to the real thing. Even The Sopranos is closer to the real thing. 
Uh, and, and that's true. And, and uh, listen, I'm not knocking the Godfather. Who doesn't love the Godfather? But it's not realistic. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing. So this this myth that you can't leave or they're going to they're going to put two in your fucking head. It's just not real. It's just not real. All right. How respected by the commission was Santos Traficante Sr.? Absolutely respected. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. I think of the two between Santo Sr. and Santo Jr., I think Santo Jr. was really the brighter of the two, uh, where he was able to take the Traficante crime family uh, past his father's death was just uh, amazing. And I think ultimately... Some people may disagree with me. I think Santo Jr. at the end of the day had a lot more power than his father ever could have wielded. Uh, he was just a wheel and dealer. He was behind Cuba, uh, behind the Kennedy thing, behind the Castro thing. He was involved in a lot of different stuff. Uh, he uh, he just a very smart guy. And I think ultimately, uh, you know, he was on the commission as well. And so he had an opportunity to state his opinion and, and help weave sort of how the mafia was going to go but in his own right both in their own rights were very tough men very intelligent men very educated men but i think santo jr ultimately at the end of the day was the more powerful of the two uh and he was able to to, to really spread out his wealth and, and spread the base of his operations in ways that i don't think his father ever could have uh all right so i got this question and i really don't want to answer it uh, and I'm going to read the question, and then I'm going to explain why I, I don't want to get into it. it. It says, why didn't New York go after Johnny Chang after the death of Phil Testa? Was it sanctioned? Uh, I'm going to answer it, but I'm going to answer it in a weird kind of way. Uh, first of all, it was a coup by Pete Casella, Frank Narducci, and Rocco Marinucci, at least according to the FBI anyway. Casella at the time was Testa's underboss, and allegedly Casella goes, he, he wants to take over, and upon killing Testa, he attempts to name himself boss, saying that the New York families had given him permission. This is not the first time that guys from Philly allegedly use this issue. We can go back to Angelo Bruno and kind of what happened there. Uh, the problem is that Nicky Scarfo didn't believe it, Scarfo was really backed by Vinny the Chin Gigante, and basically uh, he he goes there and he starts asking questions, at least if you want to believe what the FBI has to say. Uh, and New York tells him, listen, we didn't sanction any of this, but by the time that Casella finds out Scarfo's gone to ask questions, he sort of takes off uh, and ultimately paves the way for Nicky Scarfo to kind of to take over, but I don't think Nikki Scarfo. Uh, listen, was it sanctioned? No. Did Nikki Scarfo had a, a vested interest in that? Sure. I mean, who doesn't want to take over his boss? But you also have to understand that Nikki Scarfo was offered to be the boss before Chicken Man Testa was ever offered the position, and he turned it down. So that should sort of uh, lay precedence to. Uh, why Nikki Scarfo probably didn't have direct involvement. But I don't want to go there a whole lot. And the reason why is because when it comes to Philadelphia, let me explain something. I have never in my life seen bullshit from beginning to end. These FBI agents, these authors get Philadelphia wrong on every fucking level. They try to make Philadelphia sound like the gang that couldn't shoot straight. They make them try to sound like they're ruffians. They're not intelligent. They're not smart. Uh, they all talk shit. They all rat. And, and the, that's the furthest thing from the truth. I have said it time and time again. You take me 30 men who grow up together, who, who have known each other 40 years. I will go to war with them every day of the week before I will ever go to war with a guy I've only known a year. That's the truth. You cannot penetrate a wall when its foundation is built on a code and that's just the truth that's the reason why i don't like to talk about philly in terms of some of this political motivated murder and shit like that look frank narducci paid dearly for what he did he was whacked uh Sindone was whacked they all got whacked for some shit that they did but the problem in philly is it starts with one piece of fact and then it gets manipulated a million fucking times from beginning to end. And by the end of the day, if you were to sit down and read uh, the Goodfella tapes or any of these books written by George Anastasia, like post when he before he came a, a rat lover, uh, he's always been a rat lover, but more specifically a rat lover. Uh, you know, 
you, you kind of got to take stuff as a grain of salt because sometimes a murder a murder can happen anywhere. It's not Philadelphia. Murder can happen fucking everywhere. Anywhere, anytime, any place, any day over a million different reasons. Sometimes it's not over money. Sometimes it's not over politics. Sometimes it's just cuz a motherfucker doesn't like a motherfucker. It's that's reality. So I think in terms of Philadelphia there's a lot of things that get sort of manipulated. And they sort of get bent and twisted. And I don't even know why Johnny Chang is even mentioned in this. Leave the guy alone already. Uh, deal with the players that are involved. In, and listen, anything that I just answered for that question isn't from personal knowledge. It's it's just from what the FBI alleges. And how often do they get it right? Let's just be honest. How often do they get that uh, right? All right. Did they ever attempt to kill Frank Collada from the outfit? Uh you know what? As far as I know, I'm sure that that, that Tony Spilatro definitely wanted to fucking kill Frank Collada, and they should have because the guy's a rat. He's a liar. Uh, two different times he testified, and and the jury said he was laughable. Uh, that should sure remind you of another infamous rat who's made his life of doing this shit and lying on the stand. Frank Collada's a liar. Uh, he doesn't have any basis in reality. Sure, he was who he was. I don't think anybody's going to debate that. Once again, a rat gets on a stand and they make their life out to be like the godfather they've watched more mafia i guarantee you every rat is more at watch more mafia movies than anybody else that listens to my bullshit show where do you think they get their fucking nonsense from he was not believable in multiple trials could not get people convicted because he was a liar uh the fbi said they they couldn't believe him the judges said they couldn't believe him the jury said they couldn't believe him but He's entitled to make his money and lie and make make himself out to be somebody bigger than he actually was. But he's a rat at the end of the day. So I'm sure that that they wanted to kill him. Uh, but you got to look at the real damage that Frank caused. Is Frank Sammy to Bull Gravano? No. Is Frank uh, this guy or that guy or Mikey Scars? No. He really wasn't. He was a, a fucking fringe guy. Uh, uh, just, you know, listen, you guys can believe what you want, but... Real fucking serious guys like that don't need to make shit up. They can just speak the truth. Yet, I've seen it time and time again. J.R. Rubio, uh, the, the the infamous piece of shit cross-dressing rat from Jersey. Uh, Sammy Gravano. Uh, Ron Previty. Uh, they, they all made shit up. They all made shit up. Uh, and that's the reality. They, they may tell uh, bits of the truth. Because I think in anything in life, anything in life, everything's everything sort of like comes from the truth in some sort of fashion, way, uh, or circumstance. The problem is, is that they take the truth and they bend it 15 different ways to suit a narrative. Because the more that they can tell the FBI, the more that they can get John Gotti or, or any of these other people or Joey Merlino or any of these guys, the more they can get them put the fuck away, the better off it serves them the better off it serves them. So if we're going to acknowledge that they probably lie, these guys are gangsters. You think that they, their whole life is based on lies. Fraud, scams, extortion, racketeering, loan shark, and drug dealing, murder. Uh, I could name the prostitution. I could pandering. Whatever the fuck it is you want to name. Their whole entire existence is based on manipulation. Hello? So you think these guys, this is why I laugh when I get these fucking messages from these 16-year-old little girls who fucking promote Sammy to Bull Gravano. Well, he killed a 16-year-old by mistaken identity, so that's okay? They hire these little twerps to run their social media pages and just continue to, 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 uh, to substantiate lies. And I'm going to give you an example of this. That cross dresser from jersey all right this is what happens and i'm not going to name any names you you probably suspect who i'm talking about this motherfucker in one video i killed 10 guys the next video i killed 20 guys third video i killed 40 guys the next video i killed 50 guys like really if you just watch from one video to the next the lie just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger they're liars they're scumbags they're rats and they should be killed and that's the way I feel about it. Uh, I don't like people like that. I never have and I never will. So all that being said, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent there, but just consider the fucking source. Philip Leonetti, you think that guy didn't lie? Please. 
All right, do you think it's harder or easier for the FBI to infiltrate the mob nowadays, especially with all the measures of secrecy Cosa Nostra has made over the years and the war on organized crime not being what it was? Uh, first of all, nothing has changed. There's always been a war on organized crime. Look at Philadelphia, for example. The, the, the FBI isn't going to stop. The FBI is not going to stop in New York. I don't think anything has changed in secrecy. Hello, this is who we are. This is what we do. I think the difference is, is the social clubs majority were closed there are some that are still in operation in new york obviously but for the most part it was ordered that they close stop giving the fbi a visual of who we are and what we're doing from that perspective it changed but you're still seeing guys getting entrapped and arrested and caught on wiretaps loose lips sink ships uh it was uh carlos marcello that said Two people can keep a secret if one is dead. And then there's some validity and truth to that. It's macabre and it's fucking demonic or whatever. But there is some truth to that. Don't fucking tell people what you're fucking doing. If you're going to, if you're shaking a guy down, you don't need to tell your buddy, oh yeah, I just got 1500 off this cut on the fucking corner. Why would you even tell anybody? It's ego. Just be quiet. Move about your business. Do what you got to do. What you, what, listen, I, I, I have met people that did, never did a day in jail, never did, never did a fucking dime, never did nothing in prison because they just don't talk. They do their business. They go home. They do their business. They go home. These guys that need to party and do the club thing just doesn't work. Uh, but I get it. I get the ego. I get the lifestyle. I understand all that. I, I totally do on every level. But. I don't think that the FBI has really changed their tactics. I don't think the mafia has really changed their taxic, tactics as far as how to avoid the pressure. Uh, and I don't think I, I and I do think the one the one part of this question that I agree with is that I think the focus, at least post 9-11, was on counterterrorism and all of that, which allowed a lot of fringe mob groups to just start building again. But it's like everything else. History always fucking repeats itself. All right, Tommy Gagliano was was allied with the Bananos and Profacis. Why do you think his alliance didn't pass to Tommy Lucchese? Because of Tommy Lucchese's uh, friendship with Carlo Gambino. That's exactly why it didn't. Bonanno, first of all, Profaci was a fucking louse. Uh, he pinched the quarter till the eagle screamed. Didn't like his men to make any money. Uh, was uh, Charged them a fee per month to be a part of the mafia, which was ridiculous. Uh, and Bonanno was aligned with Profaci through marriage of the children. But more importantly, I think Bonanno knew he was going to be able to absorb the Profaci family at some point. And he did. Uh, but uh, Tommy Lucchese didn't have respect for either one of them, especially after Bonanno sort of wanted to kill <laughs> Lucchese and uh, Gambino to take over for himself. Uh, so, uh, so ultimately, at the end of the day, that's why I don't think that alliance passed on, because I think Tommy Lucchese... Uh, was the type of guy that was going to align himself with strong guys, align himself with people where there's a mutual benefit. There was no mutual benefit for, for being with Joe Bonanno or Joe Profaci. So that's my opinion. All right. Here we go again. I'll never understand why New York sat on their hands while Nikki Scarfo took over after the death of Philip Testa. Well, first of all, you have to understand, New York didn't sit on their hands. It was Vincent the Chingigante who wanted Nicky Scarfo and his boss. That couldn't have happened without the Chin. Uh, the Chin had actually offered the family to Nicky Scarfo prior to Philip Testa, but Scarfo, for whatever reason, uh, felt like Philip Testa was the right guy. He could wait out his time. And yeah, there's going to be those that are going to argue that Scarfo knew something was going to happen to Philip Testa, et cetera, et cetera. I don't buy any of that. Uh, but ultimately, they didn't sit on their hands. They installed Nicky Scarfo in his boss. Nicky Scarfo can't do that without the chin. So there you go. So it's not really true that they sat on their hands. I think what we can argue, and maybe this is what... Um, maybe this is what your question really is supposed to mean is why they allowed Nicky Scarfo to do what he did in the 80s. But the thing is, is that once Scarfo starts whacking everybody, he goes after the Riccobanis and God knows, you know, everybody else. The York mob doesn't want anything to do with that. This guy's killing everybody. The last thing they want to fucking do is get involved. And for good reason, Nick Caramondi and, and Philip Leonetti and all these it, 
the John VC, uh, the, the, the Ralph Natales of the world, these guys all became rats. So it was smarter for New York to stay the fuck out of that. Uh, one of the other things I, I typically get is, you know, you have the John Stanford side of things. You got the Joey Merlino side of things. And listen, I don't care what anybody says. You could say what you want about John Stanford, Joey Merlino, but Joey Merlino and that side of the faction, if we are to believe what law enforcement says and what the FBI says, which take it or leave it, uh, took it to Stanford's ass. Stanford didn't have Stanford wasn't able to sit on that fucking crown very long. Uh, or that throne very long. Uh, and I think that everyone underestimated the Young Turks. They underestimated them. They didn't underestimate them because they didn't think they could be violent. They sure as hell could be violent. What they underestimated was the uh, the power of friendship, the power of trust, the power of loyalty, the power of being together. Stanford may have thought he had it together, but in reality, did he really have it together? No, because where is Stanford now? Taking it soap on the rope in the ass in the prison. That's pretty much the way that that's, that, that's gone. And the rest has been, you know, it is what it is in Philly. But, uh, you know, you can never underestimate. The, look, youth is one thing. Never underestimate the power of friendship because that will take you through the darkest periods. Uh, and that gives you an incentive. Uh, I, I said it earlier. So, all right. Uh, did Ray Patriarca have any enemies on the commission? No, he did not. Uh, who were his allies? Everybody was. Uh, he was very tight with Carlo Gambino, very tight with Santos Traficante, very tight with a lot of people. He wielded a lot more power than a lot of people think. He was on the commission. Uh, he wielded more power than I think people ever gave him credit for in his lifetime. Maybe that's for the best benefit. Uh, but he was incredibly strong, incredibly strong. Uh, but no, no real enemies. Uh, Ray was the type of guy who uh, would be violent if he needed to be. But I think he also was the type that was sort of uh, conciliatory in the sense of if there was an issue, he wanted it resolved versus everybody arguing. And listen, he paid dearly. The Kennedys went after him for fucking 15 years. Nonstop. Nonstop. So from my perspective, I got no love for the Kennedys. I don't think I ever fucking will uh, because they were basically a crime family as well. Whether or not people ever admit to that or talk about that is another thing. Uh, but they were they were they were, what? Because John F. Kennedy was president. He was somehow not a gangster or he was his father wasn't a gangster or his brother wasn't a fucking pimp for the Hollywood elite, which he was. Uh, so listen, they have no room. They have they have no laurels to stand on. They, have, they can't they can't sit there and put themselves on a fucking plateau and say they were any better because they really weren't. They made all their money from drugs, narcotics and booze. Uh, so, listen, just don't get it twisted. That that's that's uh, sort of how I feel about it. From what I understand, if you're not a part of a family, you don't get paid for a hit. Who says I think there's been a lot of former hit guys, even informants. And, and yeah, do we believe everything? No. Uh, but I, I do think that if a guy is going to hit another guy, there there's sometimes there, there is payment involved. Uh, listen, you're not going to go to a guy off the street and say, hey, I need a favor. He's going to do it for free. Nobody's going to take a 25-year pinch for just a slap on the back and an attaboy for taking care of something like that. So that's not necessarily true. Uh, it comes as an order, and you just have to do it. That's also kind of not true either. Uh, did the mob ever hire outsiders to do a hit? Of course. The mob consistently goes out of bounds to get other guys. I think uh, there was a point where the Lucchese's were using uh, black gang members to do hits for them. Uh, a lot of a lot of some criminal organizations have used Albanians to do mob hits for them. Uh, sometimes it's always I, I think it's easy. you got to draw withdraw the heat off. You, you got to take the heat off of you. So you don't have somebody from your own family do it because that's what's going to be expected. You go to another family and have them do it. Uh, I think we've seen, uh, you know, pre Gotti or, or during Gotti's uh, short, very, very short reign that there were mob hits that were done on behalf of of the Gambinos by the Genovese's and by other families, uh, vice versa. Uh, there were Gambinos that were subletted out to the Columbos to do stuff. That's how it's always worked. Uh, being told to do something is one thing, If, uh, uh, but, but I don't believe really that's necessarily the case. I think if uh, a boss is smart, 
and he wants somebody gone, I, I think if he opens himself up to dialogue with a, a, the consigliere or somebody like that that offers him other suggestions or the pros and cons, and then the right decision is made, so be it. Uh, but but this, this idea that do this or you're dead, you know, that might have been in 1960. Uh, that might have been in like the 80s, but I don't think that that's how the, the, the mafia typically operates at this point because nobody wants to go to jail. Listen, the mafia was was really honed by Lucky Luciano when the point is, is let's make as much money as we can and stay out of prison. Who wants to go with surveillance the way it is today? Who's going to go clip somebody in the fucking corner? It's just not it's not it's not reality. But the only way that I think that a situation like that is going to happen is if there's a lot if there's a totality of people uh, that are close to uh, going to prison, then then a guy's going to make a move. But uh, of course, they hire outsiders to do stuff. Look at Murder, Inc. They were a total outside fringe group, Jewish mobsters, Italian mobsters that committed murder at the behest of the Italian mafia, which took the sort of heat off of Luciano and the other bosses. So there you go. All right. Did the Bonanos or the Profacis have any stake in Vegas casinos or Cuba? Yeah, of course they did. Uh, everybody had a, everybody that was involved, at least the heads of the families, got a percentage kickback from Cuba. Uh, as far as Vegas, that was pretty much done by the time that Bugsy Siegel got killed because then at that point, Meyer Lansky sort of was the guy to go between uh, New York and Chicago and Vegas was pretty much handed over to Chicago at that point. Now, uh, the Bonanno may have had uh, Joe Bonanno specifically may have had stakes in like the Stardust or a couple of not. Well, not the Stardust, but he may have had stakes in some of uh, the casinos, a small percentage. I know that Ray Patriarca had a huge percentage at the Sands and the Dunes. But the front for that was Frank Sinatra. So, yeah, of course they made money. Of course they had secret interests, but I'm not sure how much. Profacis, I don't think they did at all because I think that Bonanno pretty much neutralized Profaci uh, for the most part. All right. Was Jack Dragna ever on the commission? I've heard, re I've heard and seen and read several books that said he did. To my knowledge, he absolutely was not. Uh, but like I said, you know, if he was... I don't think he had a lot of say because Tommy Lucchese, uh, or excuse me, to my knowledge, I, I don't think he was. Uh, Jack Dragna was a big guy, but you got to understand, Jack Dragna got pushed around by, you know, Harry Kahn and some of these other guys. Um, but if he did have any say on the commission, it was all, it was because of Tommy Lucchese, who was actually his cousin. Uh and, and Dra Dragna's real power base came from the fact that the mob wanted to have inroads into California. They definitely wanted a space near Vegas. Uh, but Jack Dragna, really, at the end of the day, he was strong for his time, but he just he wasn't strong enough. And that's a part of the problem. All right. Why wasn't the contract carried out on crooked ass FBI agent Joe Pistone? Haven't agents and cops been killed before? All right, so this is where this gets interesting. First of all, nobody's going to kill Joe, Joe Pistone. He's a fucking FBI agent. If the mafia kills an FBI agent, are you kidding me? They would all be arrested. That would systematically shut down the fucking mob, period. End of story. You don't kill cops. You don't kill journalists. You don't kill fucking FBI agents. Those are sort of the, the rules that aren't written down, but those are the rules. Uh, the amount of heat that it would bring killing a cop or, or an FBI agent would just be absolutely fucking insane. Uh, insane. Uh, so that's exactly why nobody ever killed Pistone. Uh, I, in fact, I don't even think that there was a contract out on his head. I think Joe Pistone made that up. I think the FBI made that up to protect themselves. Uh, first of all, well, what is the mafia going to stand on the fucking corner with a bullhorn and go, all right, the first one who clips that motherfucking rat Pistone gets $150,000. Do it. How does that information come out? You know how that information comes out? A rat makes it up. A rat makes it up to, to build the propensity to testify against other people. Pistone gets a hold of it. And that's funny because through Pistone, that number has changed every year. First, it was 100000 Then it was 300000 Then it was half a million dollars. Then it was a million. Well, which one is it? So... Do I believe that to be the case? No, because I think at that point, Pistone had already infiltrated the Bonanos. They were fucked. They handled business. They killed people they needed to kill. As a result, 
Uh, and, and look at what happens. Joey Messino ends up becoming a rat. So, I mean, really, it, it, I, I just don't. And it's, it's, a, it's a good question because a lot of people have asked me that. But no, the, the mob isn't going to go after an FBI agent or a cop. A retired cop, totally different story. Uh, I think that if guys could have gotten their hands on Ron Previty, uh, he'd have been fucking laying in the Sarlacc pit eating fucking Han Solo's guts or some shit. But Ron Previty. <laughs> All right. How close did Casso come to whacking Sammy the Bull? Honestly, I don't really think very close at all because I'm going to tell you something. Gravano would be dead. Uh, gas pipe Casso, uh, rat piece of shit too. However, got to look at what Casso did. Casso was not a guy who was going to mince words. Casso was not a guy who was, I mean, what he did to Jimmy Heidel, forget about it. Uh, I think uh, reality is is that... Uh, I, I think ultimately, if if Castle wanted Sammy the Bull dead, he'd be dead. Bottom line, I think of the two, I think Castle was the tougher guy. I think Castle was more of a maniac. I think Sammy the Bull was more of a bitch, but that's just my opinion. But ultimately, they both became the same fucking thing at the end of the day. All right. What are your thoughts on how Martin Scorsese portrayed the Irish in The Departed? You know, I've been waiting for somebody to ask me about The Departed. I absolutely cannot stand that film. I think it's the worst Scorsese film he's ever made. Uh, I would probably rather watch that uh, Matt Damon and, uh, oh, fuck, that Matt Damon Liberace movie. I'd rather watch that over and over again than ever to sit through another screening of The Departed again. And let me tell you why. First of all, Matt Damon is not. Yeah, I can buy the fact that he's a cop, but I can't buy him as Conley. Uh, Jack Nicholson, great actor, can't buy him as Whitey Bulger. Uh, so I think the fact that it was based loosely on the Winter Hill Gang and et cetera, et cetera, is one thing. I just didn't like the way The Departed flowed. I certainly didn't like the fat, fact that fucking, uh, you know, uh, a character is, is uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is banging a therapist and all this other shit. It's like, it just doesn't make sense. I didn't like it. I didn't think it was a crime. I thought it was more like sort of a, a hallucination of crime. Uh, I, I just, one of the ones I don't like at all, uh, how, the, how he portrayed them, I think he portrayed them as soft. Uh, I, I think the Irish in general, even in the 20s, were nasty, 80s were 20, even today. I mean, there are some guys that are absolutely fucking deadly. Uh, I think he played... A very PC version of that. I think he played a very uh, diluted version of that. Uh, and um, I, I really, to this day, don't understand why he just didn't do a biopic on Whitey Bulger. Uh, I have a hard time buying Jack Nicholson as a gangster. That's just me. Uh, but for me, it's there's two films that I can't really tolerate under, well, three. Well, no, two. I take that back. There's two I, I just can't tolerate. The Departed is one. And the other one is A Bronx Tale. I cannot stand A Bronx Tale. I know a lot of people love that film. I can't stand it because it's bullshit from beginning to end. Uh, it's fantasy, not reality. Chaz Palminteri lied about a lot of stuff, and that's fine. But don't. And my point is this. A film is a film, right? So it's entertainment. You're supposed to go there and enjoy the film for what it is. But when you come out and you say it's a literal fucking story, that's where I kind of had a fucking problem with it. Like, don't say it's a literal fucking story and make up this weird shit about mobsters taking on bikers in a bar and Sonny was my inspiration growing up as a kid. He was the guy like, come on, it's all nonsense. It's all bullshit. Uh, and, and there's a certain couple features. Like, I think Robert De Niro was fantastic in that movie. Uh, the Lila Brancato is a degenerate junkie piece of shit. I can't stand him in any fashion or form. Uh, but the movie has its merits. Uh, the soundtrack is great. There's a couple scenes that are really good, but for the most part, I, I can't swallow anything about the film. I've never really liked it. Uh, the Departed, just as bad. Uh, I, I think that Scorsese really dropped the ball as far as that goes. But that's just my opinion. Some people may love that. Uh, some people may hate Goodfellas, and I may love it. So just, you know, it, it's to whatever the... the the. All right, here here's a reference point I'm going to make. All right. So... Before I went and saw the film Gotti with John Travolta, right? Uh, I knew going into it, there were going to be aspects of that film I just absolutely was going to despise. The reason why is because the mob, 
I don't want to say expert. People call me an expert. I'm not an expert on anything, all right? But let me just use that term for this example. Uh, the mob expert in me or the mob enthusiast in me or the mob educational person in me knew that this story was not going to be 100% accurate, okay? One, it's Hollywood. Two, I knew going into it, it also wasn't a biopic, meaning from beginning to end. So the mob genre fan in me knew I was probably going to have a hard time with a lot of it. And the mob genre enthusiast or whatever the fuck you want to call it uh, within me knew that the masses were going to hate it. Not because it would be a horribly atrocious movie, but because I think people were expecting to walk into a gangster film from born on this date to died in this date. And I think that they got thrown off because it was shot out of sequence. Not A, B, C, D, E, A, L, M, R, Q, P, 7, 6, 1, 9, whatever the fuck. Uh, I, I, I would be really interested to see what the screenplay looked like because I think that the mistake that you make is, yes, everyone knows who John Gotti is, but not everybody knows that the biographical story to that. And you can't fool mob-oriented genre people. Uh, and I think that's the mistake they made is they, they geared it more towards, uh, I think if they, I think if they had just done a straight fucking biopic, like the movie Gotti that was on HBO, if they had done it that way with Armand DeSante, they had done it that way. I think it would have been a huge success. Uh, but I, the fact that they didn't, and it was kind of all over the place a little bit. I think a lot of people, the one thing that people came back and told me was they, they couldn't follow the fucking story. They had no idea what they were watching. Uh, but you know, it is what it is, but that's that's why I talk about films. Is I, I look at films a different way. Most people go there and they, they look at for okay, is it believable? Is it a good story? I look at for I look at it for fucking accuracy. Uh, if it's not accurate and it's just filled with like gaping holes of bullshit because I know that lifestyle, I'm not entertained by it. I'm not entertained by it. All right. Uh what kind of rackets did Paul the Indian Shiro operate for the out, outfit in Arizona? I heard he did burglaries, kind of like the Hole in the Wall gang, and he also did uh, business with Emil Vachi, but later uh, whacked him. Paul was a monster from Chicago, and he was operating in Arizona. He was a close friend of Tony Spilatro's, believe it or not, and at one time was a member of the Hole in the Wall gang. Uh, and it was after Spilatro was killed that Paul took over Chicago's interest in Arizona. Uh, prior to Shiro was Detroit's Jack Taco, who oversaw Arizona. Uh, as far as rackets, murder, extortion, money laundering, and narcotics were Shiro's base of operations. But slot skimming was Shiro's major moneymaker. All right. Here we go. Joey Diaz claims on a podcast when Sammy DeRat first agreed to cooperate that the FBI went out on the streets and collected his vig for a period of time. Any truth to this? Are you fucking kidding me? Let me. OK, first of all, let me say this. I like Joey Diaz as, as a storyteller. I think Joey Diaz is a great storyteller. All right. I think Joey Diaz has done a shitload of drugs that killed half his brain cells. All that being said, he's a good comedian and he's a good storyteller. And I enjoy Joey Diaz on the Joe Rogan uh, experience. I uh, First of all, I'm a huge fan of Joe Rogan. But here's where I draw the line. Okay. Does it feasibly make any sense to you that Sammy the Bull gets pinched by the FBI and the FBI is going to go pick up his loan shark fig? Are you kidding me? Like, do you really believe the FBI? First of all, that's illegal. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing is, do you honestly think anybody's, you think that they're not, first of all, Sammy Gravano's picked up off the streets and somebody these guys don't recognize, never met, comes to collect a VIG? Are you kidding me? Joey Diaz probably heard that story somewhere. I Joey Diaz isn't going to out and out lie. But I think in this particular what we're talking about, Joey Diaz is out of his fucking mind, and it's not true. Uh, I think Joey Diaz has made a lot of assertions about Sammy the Bull that are completely fucking inaccurate. Uh, I question some of Joey Diaz's stories sometimes. Uh, but listen, he's a storyteller. He's a fucking entertainer. He's got to do what he's got to do. But in this particular case, he's either doing one of two things. Either he heard that information, and he's regurgitating it, or he's straight out fucking lying. Because neither one, that, that is the closest thing to not even being true. Ugh. 
All right, what do you know about Dino Cellini? Uh, how close was he to Lansky? Dino Cellini was really the guy who ran casinos in Cuba for Meyer Lansky, not in terms of he was the guy inside the, the casinos. He was originally from Steubenville, Ohio, was good friends with Dean Martin. Uh, they worked card games together, but he was really known for his dice game and his ability to cheat others, to be honest with you. But what made Cellini special was that he could spot a cheat a mile away. Uh, he ran gambling dens in Ohio for years until Lansky put him in business and let him run some of the casinos down in the Bahamas. Those became a success, but he really wasn't a mobster. He was he really was not a mobster in the sense of the word. Uh, he was a gambler, and he was good at running gambling establishments, uh, and he was very close to Lansky. Obviously, Lansky had to trust him to put him in the casino. So, yeah, they were friends, but his expertise was in gaming that kept him alive and very busy. And he would end up going over to Europe and doing the same thing over there. He had a good model that ran. He had a good model that made a lot of people money. Uh, but to, to really sort of make the guy a mafioso really isn't uh, the case. All right. What are your thoughts on the movie Lansky and Bugsky? Excuse me. Lansky and Bugsy. First of all, Lansky was a shit movie. Uh, <laughs> listen, I, I, Lansky was a lot of things. He was a gangster, a racketeer, a roncateur, uh, a bootlegger, a drug dealer, a hit guy. Lansky did everything. I don't think that you can make really an accurate movie on Lansky unless you're going to show every single facet of that. Uh, and until they, I, I, I would love to see that kind of film because I think that, that would be an interesting film. Uh, Bugsy, come on. Uh, it's nonsense, not not accurate. And I'm assuming by Bugsy you're talking about the fucking, uh, oh, God, what's his name? What the fuck is that jerk off saying? The guy who banged everybody in Hollywood. Uh, oh, man, I'm going to have such a fucking brain fart. Shirley Mc, McLean's brother. Uh, oh, my God. Why can't I think of his fucking name? I was just talking about him earlier today. I, anyway, Bugsy was okay, but it was a very it was a bastardized Hollywood version of events. Bugsy was in Murder Inc. Show fucking like Tommy guns and heads being sawed off, something like that. Gangster films have lost their balls. All right, and that's the fucking truth. A gangster doesn't need to sit in a room and be explained by an underboss of a family how many burrows there are how many mob families and which borough they're in. Let's just be realistic. Gangsters fucking shoot guys from behind. Gangsters dismember. They do what they got to do. And what I'm really waiting for, and I'm not saying my TV show that I'm going to be working on will do that, but it is going to be seriously fucking accurate as far as violence goes. Uh, violence doesn't need to be precipitated by a major problem sometimes it just needs to be precipitated by a beef or by an ego uh, or a jealousy or an envy or, or whatever but i think that that's the problem i think a lot of these g gangster films uh just they they lose a lot of first of all you got guys writing these things that don't understand the politics of the streets closest thing they've ever gotten to the streets is watching another film that's the truth. The really solid gangster films are the ones that come really from guys who lived that way of life. And, I'm, and listen, Henry Hill was a huge liar. He made up a lot of shit. But the only thing that Henry Hill has to his credibility is the fact that he knew Jimmy Burke, Paul Vario, and these other guys. And he can back up his role in certain events, even if he made it out to be all his idea, made himself out to be tougher than he really was. He knew some serious people. But until they come out with uh, a film of at least, this is one of the things I've always said. If you're going to write a gangster film, and, and if Hollywood's going to produce a gangster film, don't go get your Frank Culottas. Don't go get your fucking Sammy the Bulls. Go get 10 guys who grew up in a neighborhood, 10 guys who understand and know a bunch of people and understand the politics. You are going to get better dialogue. You're going to get a better story out of a bunch of guys who understand the politics behind it. They don't have to be witness to a murder. They don't have to be witness to knowing Jimmy the woman and Carmine, uh, Carmine the crab. It doesn't matter. You've got to use people that understand the politics because there is nothing until the Flanagans. You notice that, that, little, uh, that little highlight there is that through the Flanagans, you're going to understand uh, the politics of the mob. 
because nobody's ever really done it. We've seen the politics like in The Godfather 3, which was nonsense. We've seen it a little bit in The Godfather 2, but I'm not talking politics as far as politicians. Politics as far as guys not getting along, guys cutting up territory, guys understanding not to disrespect one one another. There's there's politics in everything. Guys want power. This guy wants power. That guy wants power. This guy wants to be respected. This other guy wants to be respected. So we're going to show the politics of it. And I think until there's really a film that can show the politics of this, uh, I think that's where anybody could pull a gun and blow somebody's fucking head off. How exciting is that? Yeah, it's great. Okay, there's a little vengeance, and, and we live vicariously through that. But I think at the end of the day, to understand the politics and the motivation, the mechanism behind it, that to me is what tells the story more than just, I don't like him, bang, fuck him, fuck him in his ass, fuck his mother, fuck his sister. You, you know what I mean? So, all right. What is your general opinion on El Chapo? Will you ever do some shows on cartels? Well, I sort of like living, so I don't know if I want to touch cartels. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Yeah, I I think that eventually I'm going to cover cartels. I'm going to cover bikers. I'm going to talk triads, Yakuza. There's going to be a lot of changes coming soon. We're we're going to, and what I may do is put a subcategory uh, on my YouTube page where you'll have Italian mafia, other organized crime, and then there's going to be another radio show coming that I'm slowly working on uh, that I think people are going to love. It's going to be very different. Uh, it's going to have nothing to do with crime at all. So uh, it's more of the, the comedy's perspective, but that that's coming as well. Uh, as far as El Chapo, listen, uh, listen, I, I can get inspired by anybody or anything. I can get inspired by a guy that has nothing and becomes something. Uh, what I have an issue with, and I think where I cannot uh, twist my arm, is the killing of children and, and women. Uh, I think once you go that route, that's a little disturbing to me. And I think any sort of street credit that I could sort of try to attain or to give to somebody that was a huge drug dealer, make no mistake, uh, El Chapo was one of the smartest traffickers that have ever lived uh more wealthy than than a lot of other people before him smarter than griselda blanco smarter than fucking uh uh, just really he was able to take a simple formula and like monopolize it and shoot it in a million different ways bigger than escobar could have ever been but once again how much is how much how much do you really need is 200 million 400 million 500 million not enough doesn't anybody ever just say, you know what, I'm going to make $20 million, I'm going to take it, invest in this, and, and I'm done. If guys had more of a, a a thinking, like somebody once asked me, if you could sell drugs, what would be the number that you would need to get out? $20 million, $25 million, and I'd be done. You can move to another country for $25 million, live off the, the fucking interest. You don't need to work. But guys can't do that. They have to stay in. It's because it's the power, the ego, the drive, the adrenaline that keeps them going. And that's why they do it. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, you kill women and children. You, you, you're really not. I, I just have a problem with that. And I, I don't think I could ever wrap my head around that. So I, I'm not saying uh, I, I'm just I'm simply saying I just I cannot support anybody or be fond of anybody or put anybody up on a fucking mantelpiece or a pedestal when they kill children and women. I'm just saying. Uh, I think there have been others before him that didn't need to do that. I think Escobar was worse than that to that extent. Of the two, Escobar was like Satan. But, uh, you know, I just I can't get my head around that. All right. Did the Scranton family diminish after Bill DeIlio went away? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Bill DeIlio was a stand-up guy, a tough guy, a respected guy. Uh, and I think that when you lose somebody that holds the glue of the foundation together like that, especially after buffalino has gone, uh, yeah, absolutely, 100%. I think that they diminish. They're still there. Don't get me wrong. They're still there. But it's not like it was. Uh, there's an ebb and flow and a change to everything. Uh, but absolutely, Bill DeIlio, uh absolutely unequivocally uh losing him absolutely hurt scranton all right was there a sinatra club in own zone park all right <laughs> i get this question a lot and i'm going to read this and this is my answer i don't believe a word that sal polisi says neither should you and i'm just going to leave it at that this guy never shuts the fuck up he makes up all kinds of nonsense 
Uh, I, listen, I got no respect for that guy. I never will. Uh, so there's my answer to that. All right. Last question. The more powerful boss, uh, Frank Costello or Russell Buffalino? Uh, I'm going to go with Russell Buffalino. Uh, Albert Anastasia or Vito Genovese? Ooh, I'm going to go with Vito Genovese. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I think he was more powerful than Anastasia. Although, if we look at Anastasia with the murder rank, ooh, it's kind of hard. Uh, but I think, I think, I think, uh, Post or, or pre or during Murder Inc., I think Anastasia, but I think in the end, Genovese wield more power. All right. Uh, Carlo Gambino versus John Gotti. Oh, please. There's no contest there. Carlo Gambino was <laughs> a, a light years ahead of John Gotti. Uh, Joe Bonato versus Joe Messino. Uh, I think Joe Messino ultimately, at the end of the day, be, he had this period where he was very, very strong. Uh, so I think the time period he was there, I think he was a little bit. I, I think ultimately he was. And the reason why I say that is because Bonanno fucked everything up. Bonanno had a great run for like 10 years and then fucked everything up. Uh, Messino, almost kind of the same prototype, uh, but one was a rat. The other kind of really wasn't. So for my money, I think Joey Messino. All right. Angelo Bruno versus Nicky Scarfo. Holy, well, you know what? Angelo Bruno, I think. He had more respect. I think Bruno had more power. Scarfo just killed everybody. Yes, there is power in killing somebody, but Scarfo would kill fucking his cousin if he thought if he had a dream his cousin was eating like a, a tampon on a Wednesday afternoon and he told him not to. Scarfo was fucking nuts. All right, Carlos Marcello versus Vincent Gigante. That's another one. You got to look at the time period. In the 60s, Mar Marcello was incredibly strong. Uh, but I think ultimately, the longevity wise, I think Vinny Gigante had a fuckload of power. Uh, he was able to really stay unarrested and unmolested for 30 fucking years. Uh, so I think reality is, is Vinny Gigante. But you guys may have your own. Uh, your own opinions on that. Just because it's my opinion doesn't mean it's right. It's like opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one, right? All right. So all that being said, that is the question and answer portion of the show. I'm going to take a break, inject myself with some fucking coffee. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Tony Spilatro. Stay tuned to Mob Talk Radio. In my travels, I'm always looking for a clothing brand that I feel like represents me. Anybody can go to a store and buy a t-shirt with a gimmick, but if you believe in three core values like I do, loyalty, honor, and respect, then look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. You can catch them at omertamia.com, O-M-E-R-T-A. MIA.com with locations in Europe, California, Boston, Brooklyn, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Washington. They have a great clothing line with hats, shirts, sweatshirts, keychains, anything you might need, stickers. You want the rats to stop snitching? Go right out and get yourself a sticker. But if you want to live your life by the gentleman's code, look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. And hey, welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We're going to get to Tony Spilatro, but I neglected to answer one question, and I know that this person's been asking it a lot, so I, I might as well tackle it now. Uh, the question is basically says, uh, you seem to glorify murder and mayhem in the mafia at every fucking turn. Don't you have any moral compunction? All right, to answer that, it's very simply this. Why don't you go after Hollywood? Why don't you go after the government? Uh, why don't you go after journalists? Listen, it, I don't glorify anything. Uh, I don't offer any sort of, uh, I've said on record, can you justify murder? I don't know if anybody can, but I'm going to tell you something. You're the same type of person that asked that question that firmly believes that a, ch a child molester should be murdered. Do you not agree with that? That's not glorifying it. Uh, I think that historically speaking, uh, guys who join the mafia, guys who are gangsters, they don't seek press out. They, for the most part. Uh, there have been some that have, but I think for the most part, the reality is, is that uh, Hollywood has had a love affair with gangsterism. Uh, politics has had a love with gangsterism. I mean, hello, look at what they're saying about Donald Trump. You know, he's a gangster and all this kind of nonsense. But the truth is, at the end of the day, Hollywood glorifies them more than I ever could. Now, if we're going to talk a street perspective, uh, I think where I differ from a lot of people is that I've seen it. I've been around it most of my life. And I think that if you, and I've said this a million times, if you are going to join a criminal organization, it's kill or be killed. That's, that's the streets. 
that's how the streets operate. Uh, could I justify somebody blowing somebody's brains out? No, that's what they need to do. But that is the life that they've chosen to live. If I report on it, I'm reporting on it. I'm not glorifying it. Do I think that rats should be put face down, ass up into a pit? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that uh, if you join a criminal organization, you have no right to tell on anybody else. You are uh, acknowledging that you're going to participate in whatever. You're going to make money in, in whatever fashion form. What gives you the right to tell on somebody? Uh, so it, the, the, the press consistently, and this is why I bring up the pedophilia shit, the press consistently, consistently posts articles about this pedophile getting clipped, that pedophile getting clipped. You can't tell me that there's not justification for that. Uh, because I'll be honest with you, if anybody I knew got molested by somebody, I'd kill him. I wouldn't hesitate. I would not hesitate. Uh, listen, we have laws in this country where the death penalty is allowed. That's all about justification. You can't tell me, nope, that's just the, the penalty that's imposed. Bullshit. It's an eye for an eye. Just You go back to Bibli the, the Bible, and I'm not going to get all religious and all that bullshit, but look at the Bible, an eye for an eye. That's the way the Bible is. You, you look at the Bible, and it's whole. The Bible is about murder and fucking mayhem. Uh, and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of Southern right religious people will use like the, the common phrase of after the dispensation of Christ, you know, we no longer, uh, go by the, the beginning of the Bible because after the dispensation of Christ, everything sort of changes bullshit and eye for an eye. That's the way it's always been. Every movie we watch eye for an eye, uh, Florida has the death penalty they execute fucking retarded people. Uh, you can't justify to me that, that somebody that, that is mentally challenged does something egregious and they kill them. Uh, we want to make a moral compunction that somebody who is mentally disabled or somebody that uh, is depressed or has anxiety or PTSD and kills somebody, they want to use a label and try to justify it by saying, well, you know, they have mental issues and this is why it happened. Bullshit. Everybody knows the difference from right and wrong. There's not a single person on this planet that doesn't know putting a gun in somebody's head, blowing it off is wrong. Everybody knows the difference between right and wrong. So the death penalty is an eye for an eye. It's meant to show judgment and it's meant for uh, the victims of this crime and the family to have rec recompensation or uh, compensation for what's been done to them. So you can't sit here and tell me that I glorify it. You can't sit here and tell me that I do all this stuff when we have laws that allow this kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to get rid of the death penalty, then that changes, but it's an eye for an eye. It always has been. So I don't think that I do anything different than anybody else doesn't do, but I'm not making $20 million a year showing people get killed. I can understand the, the moral implications and the moral arguments that you're trying to make to me. But at the end of the day, I just have a different set of values than people do. And I'm not saying my values are right. They're probably a little bit fucked up and skewed. I'll be honest with you. That's just the way I was brought up. That's what I believe in. And that's just uh, the reality of it. But take that up with your politicians. Take that up with other people. Don't, don't bring it up to me. All right. So all that being said, we're going to get to Tony Spilatro. He was born in Chicago, Illinois on May 19th of 1938, the fourth of six children to Pasquale Spilatro and Antoinette. Uh, his father immigrated to New York City from Trigiano, Italy, which is in the Bari section of Italy. Uh, in 1914, Pasquale might have stayed in New York, but he really didn't have a particular set of skills or an education. So the family ends up settling in Chicago, also known as the Patch off 2152 North Melvina Avenue. Uh, Pasquale and Antoinette would end up running Patsy's Restaurant, which was off of 470 North Ogden, which was a bit... Uh, it was pretty much a mafia hangout over on the west side of Chicago, and these men would use the parking lot as a meeting spot to discuss mob business and issues. Sam Giancana, Jackie Cerrone, Gus Alex, and Frank Nitti were some of the names that consistently frequented the restaurant and the parking lot. Uh, in 1954, Pasquale would suffer an aneurysm and would die at the age of 55, leaving behind a wife and six sons. Uh, by most accounts, the death of Pasquale affected Tony the most. Uh, he was never really good at school to begin with, but the crisis of losing his father just added to the problems as Tony was bullied constantly throughout school. Uh, and his father also dying young left the family in a deep 
financial situation. Uh, in his sophomore year of high school, Tony had seen enough and ends up dropping out of school completely. Uh, he wasn't just a poor student, but he repeatedly was in trouble for fighting and even in one case broke the jaw of a principal. So we can see from a young age, Tony sort of got a penchant for violence. Uh, along with his brothers, Vincent, John, Victor, and Michael, Tony would venture into petty crimes. Tony's brother, Pasquale, was the only Spalatro to really make a life for himself by becoming a renowned surgeon. Uh, everybody else had sort of a bigger appetite for the streets. Uh, Tony would begin his criminal life by shoplifting and purse snatching. His first arrest would come in January of 1955 when he was arrested for attempting to swipe a shirt from the River Forest store and was charged with larceny. He was fined $10 and placed on probation. And this would just be the beginning for Tony Spilatro. Spilatro and his brothers grew up very much inside and around mob guys. And by 21, Spilatro had already committed three murders and had been arrested 13 times. It was through Mad Sam DiStefano, which if you go on the YouTube page and you type in Mad Sam DiStefano Mob Talk Radio, I did a show on him as well. So you can get some background on him that way. I don't have to do it here. Uh, but because of Mad Sam, Tony Spilatro grew more powerful on the streets. DiStefano was a psychopath in his own right, uh, but he notices something in Tony Spilatro. He was fearless and he would use violence easy and would do what he was told. He was a guy they could go to and they knew it would get done. Uh, it was under Di Stefano that Spilatro learned how to extract information from people and to brutally torture those who fucked with him or anybody else. It was Spilatro's friendship with Di Stefano that would get him actually made at 25 years old. In 1962, a set of murders would sort of seal Spilatro's rise in the Chicago outfit. It was obviously called the M&M Murders. You can look up information on that, but I'll talk a little bit about it here. Uh, Jimmy Miragula and uh, Billy McCarthy at the time were really working specifically with Frank Culotta, and Frank Culotta kind of had a burglary, a burglary crew uh, that were going around doing a lot of shit, making a lot of money, but they made the mistake of killing the Scalvo brothers who were connected to the outfit, and they did it without permission. Uh, up until this point, Spilatro really hadn't killed anybody on the mob's behalf. It was more uh, of his own devices and retribution, but both McCartney and Miragula Made the, situ worse, made the situation worse by carrying out hits in mafia-controlled territories and ended up killing a civilian in the process, which fully enraged the outfit bosses. It's one thing to be operating on your own. It's another to kill associates uh, without permission. And then when you kill somebody that has nothing to do with anything, that just sort of draws heat, and that creates a problem. Uh, the outfit wanted to know who did it, and they wanted them killed immediately, and they made it clear that whoever killed them would be in the graces of the Chicago outfit. And this was Tony Spilatro's real chance to prove himself. Uh, Tony had been collecting for Mad Sam DiStefano, uh, who was a huge loan shark and completely fucking vicious and a psychopath. Uh, Tony had heard what the, that the bosses were upset, and he took it upon himself to investigate. He knew this would be his one shot to sort of make sort of a statement about himself. Tony went to the streets. He begins asking around and was able to find out that McCarthy and Miragula were likely the two culprits. Uh, he had heard they were working for Frank Culotta uh, and that Culotta was also likely involved in the murders themselves. So Tony and Frank kind of went back in time. They kind of grew up together, knew each other very loosely. They actually met when they were shining shoes as kids. Uh, while they were friends, they weren't exactly like best friends. Uh, Tony ends up calling Frank and basically tells him, look, you got two options. You can either prove your loyalty to the outfit and to me uh, and be a stand-up guy by killing Miragula McCarthy, uh, or you could be laying in the streets right next to him. Uh, Frank really didn't have any options at that point. He was afraid of Spilatro, and he realizes quickly it's probably in his best interest if he wants to live very long to sort of do as he was told. Uh, the difference was that Tony didn't necessarily want Frank Collada to kill them. Tony kind of wanted to do it himself. So what ends up happening is Frank is able to lure McCarthy, uh, to a meeting spot where Spilatro was waiting for him. Uh, but, but before Tony would kill McCarthy, he wanted to know exactly who McCarthy was working with and who helped him in killing the murders. Uh, Tony already knew, but it was sort of a power trip for Spilatro, and it was almost a sadistic sort of action. Uh, McCarthy actually 
refuses to mention anybody's name, so for the next three days, Spilatro would beat, ice pick, and stab McCarthy for hours and hours and hours on end. McCarthy still refused to, refused to budge, so Tony got a little inspiration from Mad Sam, and he put McCarthy's head into a vice, turning it until uh, McCarthy's eye popped out of his head. Spilatro would then remove the eye with a knife, and that's when McCarthy begins to talk. And McCarthy tells Tony that his helper was Miragula. And then he begs Spilatro to end his suffering by killing him, uh, which Tony obliges by slitting his throat immediately. A couple days later, McCarthy and Miragula's bodies would be found in the back of an abandoned car's trunk. And Spilatro would be celebrated by the bosses. And then because of those two murders, he was made an official member of the outfit. In 1963, Tony... Spilatro kills Leo Foreman. Leo Foreman was a real estate broker and an agent and a half-assed loan shark who really made the mistake of telling Mad, damn St- uh, Mad Sam DiStefano to go fuck himself and throw S- Stefano out of his office. Stefano obviously isn't going to put up with that, and he goes to Tony Spilatro for help. Uh, Tony would end up luring Foreman to, to Mad Sam DiStefano's basement under the guise of a profitable card game he could play in. And once Leo arrives, he gets tortured by both DiStefano and Spilatro repeatedly. Uh, They stabbed him in the balls, the face, the back, and the chest with an ice pick. Uh, And they even cut pieces of his flesh off from his body, all while he was alive and awake before killing him ultimately by shooting him. Uh, Both DiStefano and Spilatro Uh, would be indicted for that murder, but ultimately would be acquitted. Now, because of Tony's skills in extracting information and just the fact that he was just had such brutality, the mob really didn't have a problem with him doing things for them. Uh, In 1964, Frank Lefty Rosenthal was having some problems being pushed around down in Florida, specifically in Miami. And so what ends up happening is uh, the Frank Rosenthal, first of all, we have to understand why Frank Rosenthal was was sent to Miami to begin with. And the reason why he was sent there was sort of a two part sort of answer here. But the the more interesting part of it was he was just sent down there because he was good at fixing horse races, good at the odds. He was a great handicapper. Uh, and Frank also needed to get out of Chicago. Frank Rosenthal actually was a Jew- Jewish associate of the Chicago outfit as well as the New York mob. And he grew up on the west side of Chicago and learned how to bet and handicap sports events at a very young age. His father also owned a, owned a horse track. Uh, and he learned at a very young age how to use the odds, how to use percentages to his benefit. Uh, and by the mid 50s, Frank Lefty Rosenthal was in full swing working for the Chicago outfit. Uh, Rosenthal could make gold from turds and was pretty much running at the time the biggest sports book operation in the United States. Uh, another reason why he ends up in Florida was that he gets indicted as a co conspirator on multiple sports bribery charges. Chicago didn't want to lay, didn't want to lose the goose that laid the golden egg. And so they basically send Rosenthal down to Miami to set up shop. Tony Spilatro would actually be sent down to watch over him and make sure that he was able to operate and be left alone from other mob crews that were there. Uh, the Florida operations wouldn't last long as Rosenthal had some serious problems in the early 1960s. In 1961, Rosenthal, who at this point was well known in criminal circles uh, and to the U.S. government, uh, was issued a subpoena to appear before the United States uh, Senator John McClellan Subcommittee on the Gambling and Organized Crime. Uh, he was specifically accused of basically sports fixing. Uh, He invoked the Fifth Amendment 37 times. He was never charged for a crime. But because of this, he was banned from racing establishments in Florida, which sort of put him in a pinch. Then in 1963, he would be arrested and convicted of bribery. Uh, Rosenthal was actually, and the reason why is Rosenthal was able to actually get an NYU basketball player to shave points versus North Carolina gets caught, et cetera, et cetera. To make matters worse, he was suspected of car bombings and multiple business bombings down in Florida, and the FBI would open an ongoing profile on Lefty Rosenthal, which was over 400 pages in length. And as a result of that heat, uh, Lefty Rosenthal wants to head to Vegas in 1968. Meanwhile, Spilatro was already back in Chicago, having left Miami. 
Uh, Tony was struggling a bit financially and was sort of sick of the scene in Chicago. Uh, he couldn't seem to withdraw the heat, and he wanted to escape uh, the consistent police harassment. And in 1971, he ends up making contact with Frank Lefty Rosenthal, uh, who was banking serious money in Las Vegas. The problem was a lot of people were trying to shake Lefty down in Vegas, and the outfit wanted control over the situation. More specifically, they wanted to ensure that Rosenthal wasn't fucked with, and they wanted to make sure that the skimming went the way it was supposed to, and that there were no hiccups. Uh, this is exactly why they end up sending Tony Spilatro to Vegas. Uh, it wasn't because they wanted a new crew in Vegas. It, it, it was just really at the end of the day, they wanted to make sure that the flow of money kept coming and that Rosenthal pretty much was oversaw and just, just sort of kept eyes on. Uh, and Tony ends up heading out to Las Vegas. Uh, when Spilatro arrived, uh, he was pretty much shocked by what Rosenthal had accomplished. Rosenthal was a man about town. Rosenthal was running the Stardust, the Fremont, the Mariana, and the Hacienda, which were all owned by the Chicago Outfit outright. Rosenthal also controlled and invented the first actual sports book, which operated from within a casino, which made the Stardust one of the casinos on... It, it made the Stardust the best casino on the Strip and certainly the most wealthiest. Uh, Rosenthal also installed female blackjack dealers, which tripled, which tripled the income uh, of the Stardust the previous year. So uh, Frank Lefty Rosenthal knew what he was doing. He knew how to operate a casino, knew how to operate the odds, just knew how to do what he did. Uh, Splotcher's job basically was to ensure that Rosenthal's safety was protected but Spalatra sort of gets bored in Vegas. It was the boredom that would ruin Rosenthal and the outfit's power in Las Vegas. Spalatra and Rosenthal worked together in tandem to skim profits from casinos, and they made sure that outfit bosses got their cut, as well as Midwest bosses, including Kansas City, St. Louis, and Milwaukee. Uh, Tony would use profits he made uh, from various things in Vegas to open up a gift shop inside the Circus Circus Hotel, which was a family-style uh, casino and hotel in Vegas. Rosenthal was very weary about Spilatro being there to begin with, uh, especially frequenting inside the hotels because he knew the FBI and Gaming Commission was watching close, but Tony wouldn't hear any of it. He was just going to do what he was going to do. Uh, the Circus Circus offered first-class entertainment for kids, so basically they had great little things for kids and entertainment for kids while the, the parents were gambling inside the casino itself. The hotel was then owned by Jay Sarno. In 1974, the hotel would be sold by Sarno, and Spilatro's initial investment of $75,000 to open the gift shop was sold for $700,000, so he made a huge killing off that. With the money from the skim and the money from that investment, Spilatro would been, begin loan sharking with backing from the Los Angeles Mafia captain, Frank Bumpensero, in Las Vegas. In 1972, Spilatro would get indicted for the murder of Leo Foreman, who was a real, like I said earlier, was a real estate agent loan shark who fucked up by telling Sam DiStefano to basically go fuck himself. Uh, and this murder took place in 1963. In November of 75, Spilatro with Frank Bompensero whacked Tamara Rand, who was a millionaire real estate broker and a property investor from San Diego. And the reason for the hit had more to, to do with mob politics than anything else as Spilatro and Bompensero were protecting Alan Glick. And Alan Glick was basically the mob frontman out in Vegas who effectively was able to attain Teamsters, pension fund, and union money to open casinos to begin with. And it was Tamara Rand. Uh, she is was actually at the time suing Alan Glick uh, because she wasn't getting any payback from a $2 million loan that she made to him. Uh, and Spilatro effectively uh, was ordered to take care of the issue for Alan Glick because they wanted to protect Alan Glick. It was good for business. So Spilatro ends up sneaking into her house and blows her head off. Uh, and Alan Glick, nor the mob, uh, needed the heat from anybody getting sued. They risked to lose too much. And that's exactly why uh, Tamara Rand had to go. In 1976, Spilatro would open up Gold Rush Limited with his brother Michael and Herbie Blitzstein. And the Gold Rush was basically like a pawn shop. It was located a mile from the Strip. It was a combination jewelry store, pawn shop, and electronics factory. Uh, it was there that Michael, Tony, and Herbie Blitzstein would gain experience fencing stolen goods. Uh, everybody that stole anything, jewelry, uh, 
gold, whatever, it came through uh, Gold Rush uh, Limited. Uh, but it creates problems for Lefty Rosenthal. It, it's Tony's real job at the end of the day was to oversee Rosenthal safety, and it was to control employees and to control those overseeing the skim uh, and et cetera. But Spilatro couldn't really stay out of the way. Uh, Spilatro was loan sharking to card dealers from within the casino. Uh, he was loan sharking to casino management. They wouldn't hesitate walking into a casino and beating somebody's head in with a pipe in front of everybody if a payment was late. So automatically, we see that Spilatro is really sort of uh, creating issues there. Uh, to make matters worse, Spilatro forms the Hole in the Wall Gang. The Hole in the Wall Gang was a crew of about 16 people. Uh, including Michael Spilatro and Herbie Blitzstein, who became basically a breaking and entering crew. And the crew was rather ingenious. They would enter buildings via the exterior walls, the ceilings of the buildings uh, that they would hit. This way they could bypass uh, the alarm systems. Uh, the crew would operate out of the Gold Rush Limited, and other members included Peter Basile, Frank Collada, Joseph Cusimano, Sammy Cusimano, Joe D'Argento, Ernie DeVino, Leo Gardino, uh, Frank DeLeg, uh Michael LaJoy, Ernest Lenig, uh, Wayne Mateki, Larry Newman, Butch Pansko, Peanuts Pansko, uh, Salvatore Romano, and Gerald Tomachek, and Carl Urbanati, and former Detective Joe Blasco. In fact, former Detective Joe Blasco was basically their lookout guy, uh, and he was a bartender over at the Crazy Horse 2, which was a strip clo club that was owned by Rick Rizzolo. While it was all systems go for Spilatro, he was causing a lot of problems for Rosenthal. Uh, Tony sort of became a pseudo boss in Vegas, and people were associating Rosenthal with Spilatro, and it just drew heat in a way that was wrong for everybody involved. Uh, Frank Rosenthal really wanted to sort of handle it a different way. He wanted to call Chicago and kind of get Tony sent back, but he knew that if he did, Spilatro would likely kill him rather than lose his stature or his money. Uh, in 1976, the FBI and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department found out that Rosenthal was secretly running four large casinos without obtaining a Nevada gaming license. This in large part was due to Tony not being able to stay in the shadows. Uh, every time Spilatro was seen, they connected Frank Lefty Rosenthal. Uh, there would end up being a hearing to determine Rosenthal's legally legal ability to obtain a gaming license, and the hearing was headed by Nevada, Nevada Gaming Commission Control Board Chairman and future U.S. Senator Harry Reid. Uh, Rosenthal ultimately gets denied a license based on prior arrest records and documented reputation as an organized crime associate, but most importantly because Tony Spilatro was seen all over the fucking place and in casinos. So they never, they, so there can be an argument made that if Tony Spilatro isn't making waves and creating problems, and, and Rosenthal doesn't have to clean up after his fucking mess, then maybe Harry Reid doesn't look too much into Frank Lefty Rosenthal. Uh, I know in the movie Casino, they you know they use it that, that he comped for senators and he wouldn't give somebody's uh, nephew a job. And, and that's not really, really the way it happened. It was because of Spilatro uh, that Frank Lefty Rosenthal takes the serious heat and so he basically loses his gaming license which means he cannot control the gaming he cannot be in the casinos uh he wasn't blacklisted but he just couldn't work in them and rosenthal was absolutely furious uh tony spilatro couldn't keep his face out of public and he was gallivanting in vegas like al capone uh frank would end up finding a few ways around the issue by like making himself director of entertainment, director of food and beverage, hiring manager, and even for a time he would have his own television show which streamed from inside the casino itself, which really sort of infuriated the outfit because he was battling the senators and battling the Nevada Gaming Commission basically in a public forum, and they didn't want that. They felt like, you know what, put your name on some bullshit little title, but just stay in the casino, stay quiet, stay out of trouble, and Frank Lefty Rosenthal doesn't do that uh he's pissed off and and he's just making the issue even bigger uh for them uh the the chicago outfit bosses felt that it was better not to be seen or be heard and it also didn't help that tony spilatro was banging lefty rosenthal's wife jerry 
Uh, and if Rosenthal even took that to the bosses, realistically, Tony would be killed and rightfully so on that basis, only because uh, even though Frank Lefty Rosenthal wasn't a made guy, he was a moneymaker for them. Uh, and if they had found out initially when this happened that, that Tony Spilatro was banging Frank's wife, they probably would have remotely, I, I would imagine, killed him. I think that they would have. Uh, but that really presented a problem, and that pretty much ended the friendship between Frank Rosenthal and Tony Spilatro. And then it creates more problems for the skim because now they don't have somebody watching over the skim. And that's another thing that infuriates Chicago. As a result of Rosenthal being ousted, it didn't take long for the Nevada Gaming Commission to put Tony Spilatro into the black book, meaning he couldn't enter a casino for any fucking reason not to eat, not to not to piss, not to shit, not for excuse me, not for nothing. But it didn't stop Tony Spilatro from doing that. It didn't stop him from going in and still cracking fucking heads. Uh, and by, by getting blacklisted, it meant he lost the, the dealers. He was loan sharking to, he lost a lot of bookmaking and he lost a lot of income. As a result of that, he ended up blaming Frank Rosenthal for that. But the truth is he created the mess for Rosenthal in the outfit, uh, by his behavior. Uh, and then what ends up happening in 1981 is what we call the Bertha, uh, and this was basically the Bertha was a household product store, which was a high end store that was making close to $15 million a year with over 35 employees, uh, Liberace, Wayne Newton, Frank Sinatra. They were all big shoppers there. Uh, and there was basically an attempted burglary. It was a totally botched burglary, uh, Blasco, Colada, uh, Gardino and Matecki and Newman were all caught. They all get arrested and they get charged with burglary conspiracy to commit burglary attempted grand larceny in possession of burglary tools uh they were all locked locked up in the las vegas police department holding cell and the only members of spilatro's gang who were not arrested were herbie blitzstein uh cusimano romano and michael spilatro uh frank colada actually tried to call tony spilatro to to get him to get a lawyer uh but tony spilatro wasn't going to help him didn't give a shit Several calls get end up getting made and back and forth, and Spilatro ends up conceding that he would help. But Colada kind of gets a weird vibe from Spilatro. He kind of feels like Spilatro likely would kill him, and it's a good thing that that the law enforcement sort of stepped in uh, because they were ended. They ended up picking up on a wiretap where Spilatro basically ordered a hit on Colada, and had he been bailed out, which was being arranged, uh, Colada would have been killed. Uh, 100%. And as soon as Frank sort of hears uh, this wiretap, he immediately becomes a rat. Sal Romano would be the next to turn rat as well. And Spilatro would try to control sort of the narrative of that by having anybody he thought that was going to rat killed, but it just created more informants. Uh, in 1983, Tony Spilatro would be indicted in Las Vegas for murder and racketeering based on Frank Collada's testimony, but Collada crumbled on the stand it was an absolutely atrocious witness. Uh, none of the charges would stick. Collada also gave information into the M&M murders, and Spilatro would end up getting indicted back in Chicago for those crimes. But once again, Collada failed failed uh, as far as testifying and Spilatro against Spilatro and was considered a non-credible witness, and the judge found Collada to be not reliable whatsoever, and Spilatro ends up getting acquitted of those crimes. So Frank Collada, for all his chagrin and all his grandstanding, was a horrible fucking witness against Tony Spilatro. Uh, so at this point, the outfit's seen enough. Uh, they've seen press clippings. They don't like it. They heard. Then they find out that they basically... Tony Spilatro was banging Lefty Rosenthal's wife, and they sort of realized that Spilatro had made the, decision, the, the situation worse for all of them in every regard and wanted to cut their losses. It, in, in basically, in, it had, in effect, ruined the money coming in for, from Rosenthal, which is multi-millions of dollars a year, and the outfit worried uh, that in revenge to all of this, that Frank Lefty Rosenthal might go talk to the feds, and they tried to neutralize him by attempting to kill him in a car bomb, but it didn't work, and Rosenthal basically lived from the situation and basically never, ever other uttered a word ever again. Uh, it seemed like everywhere Tony Spilatro went, he caused a ton of havoc, and the mob was just sick of it. Uh, 
So Spilatro's back in Chicago, and he's very nervous being there because he knew he was sort of in trouble. Uh, he knew the outfit was done with him, and he felt that you know maybe he had a little chance to sort of defend himself. Then in January of 86, there was a meeting called by Tony Accardo at the Czech Lodge in North Riverside. It was a meeting to realign positions as Joe Ferriola was named street boss. Accardo would stay on as consigliere. Gus Alex would remain the head of the connection, guys. Uh, the second order of business was the drama that surrounded Tony Spilatro. They discussed the mess Spilatro had created, and when it was mentioned that he was fucking Jerry Rosenthal, Ferriola absolutely goes fucking nuts. Uh, he asked around the room if others have heard this. He asked around the room for others to verify it, and they all said they had heard it, but you know they just kind of wanted to stay north of it, and that was it right there. That was enough to seal Spilatro's fate. He was a dead man. Uh, Tony and Michael end up getting a call from black sam carlisi to attend a meeting at a hunting lodge, lodge owned by joe uh, ayupa both spilatros entered the lodge were beaten and bludgeoned and driven to a cornfield in enos indiana where they were found buried alive however in 2007 and this is going to get a little back and forth here so just hang on tight with me uh in 2007 rat nick calabresi testifies at the Operation Family Secrets trial that the brothers were actually killed in Bensonville, Illinois, in a basement under the guise that Michael was going to be made. However, I don't really believe that to be the case. And the reason is, is because the autopsy that was done on the Spilatros showed sand within their lungs, meaning that they were actually breathing when they were dumped into the hole out in Indiana. However, Moving forward, in 2005, 14 members of the outfit were indicted for 18 murders, including the murder of the Spilatros. As a result of the 2005 trial, the FBI now alleges that the Spilatros uh, were probably more realistically murdered at the hunting lodge. Now, let me tell you something. Tony Spilatro was not a fool. I don't think on, under any situation he could have been led to a basement at somebody's house under the guise of somebody being made. Uh, I don't buy it. I think Nick Calabrese is a fucking liar. I don't think he's ever told the truth about really anything. Uh, and so I, I happen to agree with the FBI assertion here that they were most likely probably killed or at least bludgeoned severely at the hunting lodge. Uh, it is believed that Alec, Albert Taco, uh, Nick Cozino, Dominic Palermo, and Albert Rivero were, were the culprits in the orders from Ferriola via Ayupa. The FBI has long thought that Spilatro was responsible for 22 murders, and over the years, many thought Spilatro had tried to kill Rosenthal. I don't particularly buy that. I think that that was more of a message from the, the Midwest boss for Rosenthal to keep his fucking mouth shut and shut up. Um, Spilatro actually is responsible, according to many various sources of killing Sam uh, Di Stefano, uh, his own uh, sort of mentor. He was responsible for the killing of Sam Giancana as well as William Ax Ax Action Jackson. Uh, in fact, it was uh, William Action Jackson who was an, who was rumored to be an informant that they hung him by a meat hook by his asshole. They beat him. And then they used a cattle prod on his balls before he succumbed to uh, his injuries. So what we've systematically got, and I know this wasn't a like tremendous, huge, huge, huge show on Tony Spilatro. And then there's a reason for that. There's not a lot known about his early childhood other than a few, few things. Uh, but basically, Tony Spilatro ends up uh, really making his bones in the early days for Sam Stefano. Uh, can be a trusted guy, and then he kind of ends up out in Vegas, and I think Vegas was obviously a, a horrible idea uh, because it was after Spilatro went out there that, that what ends up happening is Chicago loses its grip over the casinos and the corporations come in. Alan Glick gets arrested, and there's a lot of things that happen. The Teamsters get ousted, uh, and everybody sort of loses whatever power they had in Vegas. Uh, if Tony Spilatro had just gone out there, and watched over Frank Lefty Rosenthal and just kind of uh, kept to himself and didn't try to like organize himself out in Vegas. I think this, I think that, I think obviously, I think uh, some of the family secrets trial shit doesn't happen. Uh, I think that uh, Chicago continues to uh, be a powerful force in politics, too. I, I think Tony Spilatro really was. Uh, a nightmare for them in a lot of ways uh you know banging another guy an associate's wife and all of that kind of nonsense that's that's one thing 
Uh, but when he goes out there and he makes heat for himself and he can't stay out of trouble and the heat just keeps coming, ultimately Rosenthal gets ousted out of the casinos. Uh, and that's a huge blow to the to, to the Chicago mob and the Midwest mob because he was their guy in there. He was the guy that made the odds work. He's the guy that made sure the skim ran work uh, ran well. He's the guy that made Chicago millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, why Chicago? And, and maybe I'll never know the answer to this, but why Chicago allowed Spilatro to run amok like that is beyond me because I, there had to have been talk that there were problems. Uh, but I think Lefty Rosenthal being a stand-up guy wasn't about to pick up a phone and complain about anybody. Uh, he dealt with it the way that he needed to. Uh, and I think once he's ousted uh, and, and put in a black book, he, I mean, he's fucking done. He can't do anything. He can't he can't maneuver. Uh, and, of course, you know, Tony Spilatro is going to look for somebody to blame. And, and who does he blame? He blames Rosenthal. Well, if you weren't on TV and if you weren't doing this, you weren't doing that. None of this would have happened. And, and it's the ego that's involved. Uh, Tony Spilatro was horrible for the Chicago outfit. Uh, and I know there are those who like Tony Spilatro, his character, and how he was. I don't think there's any uh, disparaging thing I, I can say about him not being a tough guy. He was. But I think also... Uh, they sent the wrong individual out to Chicago. Uh, they sent a psychopath, somebody who couldn't keep it together, somebody who couldn't stay out of trouble. Uh, and he hired them, brought the wrong people around him. And look what happens. Uh, you know, Frank Collada may not have been successful as far as Palatro went, but he was su successful in getting other people sent away. And Romano was responsible for that. And so what it is, is it's a domino effect. Uh, you take a guy that that's making realistic money in the streets. He's loan shark and bookmaking, whatever. He's murdering. He's at the behest of the Chicago outfit. He's doing what he's got to do. And then you take a guy like that who's already got an ego, and you send him out to Vegas, and you don't put the reins on him. There's no leash on him. And he's able to do whatever the fuck he wants. And the Chicago outfit's so concerned with the money that they're getting, and they don't want to fuck that up. Maybe they turned a blind eye to some of the shit that they're hearing. Uh, maybe they should have been more defensive of, of, of Frank Lefty Rosenthal. I think that if the decision were left up to me, I think I would have clipped Spilatro early on. Uh, because ultimately, look at what Chicago loses. Political power, especially in Nevada. Uh, they lose the casinos as a result. They lose hundreds of millions of dollars. Why? Because Tony Spilatro wanted to do B&Es or because he wanted to loan shark who loan sharks with inside the casino? Uh, who is blacklisted from casinos and still continues to go in there and pipe people? So Spilatro in Chicago, I think, was worth more to them in Chicago than he was once he goes out to Vegas. Once he goes out to Vegas, he goes off the rails. He does whatever he wants. And that's exactly why he's killed. Uh, I know a lot of people have speculated stuff about Michael Spilatro and et cetera, but that's why he's killed. First of all, he's responsible for killing some of the bigger names in Chicago, but I don't even think that it was necessarily the fact that he banged Lefty's wife that really, they lost casinos because of him. They lost hundreds of millions of dollars because Spilatro couldn't put his belt in the fucking notch and stay out of trouble. And that's the reality uh, of why Tony Spilatro ultimately gets killed at the end of the day. Uh, it, it, it probably has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, first of all, he's under indictment constantly, can't stay out of trouble. He's getting thrown out of every casino. It, really, at the end of the day, this is because this guy can't stay off the radar. Uh, they ordered him back to Chicago, which is why he ends up there. Other than the indictment, they order him back there, and that's why he truly went back. And he had to have seen this coming. I, I can't imagine uh, in any way, shape, fashion, or form. Uh, and I know that through the years there's also been rumors that he was taking more money off the top. Uh, I know that he tried to put it in Chicago's ear that Lefty Rosenthal was taking more money off the top than he was supposed to. But that's all nonsense. It really comes down to, to dollars and cents. And the dollars and cents of it is he was reckless. They lost the casinos. And the Chicago outfit, from that perspective, I'm not talking about today's time period like right now in 2019. But I think as a result of Tony Spilatro and then the, the, the Family Secrets trial decimated the Chicago outfit for over a, almost two decades. Uh, where Chicago is now, 
is they're strong. They've always been strong. They don't have they don't own the political machine like they used to, but they're strong. Uh, uh, but the thing is, is single individuals who think about nothing but themselves and put themselves ahead ahead of the greater good of what we consider to be Cosa Nostra, uh, you sort of get what's coming to you. Uh, and you know, uh, I think that uh, Tony Spilatro's uh, piece of history. Uh, especially in the Chicago mob, is should be looked back on as a guy who decimated them. Uh, he didn't turn a rat, didn't go that route. But when you do things that bring heat on thirty other people, that it, 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 it's I'm not comparing it to being a rat, but it, but it's the same sort of process of. If you join something, yes, you want to have money, you want to survive, you you got an ego, you want to have power. But there's ways of doing that without not bringing down a whole entire fucking criminal group. And the problem was, is he put himself ahead of everybody and he paid dearly for it. Uh, it, it, You know, and and that's the reality of it. Uh, And so, you know, if we look at Casino, and, and this is what I'm going to end on. If we look at Casino, you know, Casino really is a good movie. I, I love Casino. But the thing is, is like, is it real? Not really, because I think that what they did was they hedged the storyline based on some things that weren't really accurate. Uh, it wasn't just because he banged Lefty's wife. It, it, you know, Joe Pesci, I think, played uh, a character by the name of Nicky Santoro, who I think who was based on Tony Spilatro. And I think that he was as close as like where you're ever going to get to Tony Spilatro. Uh and the scene where Bob De Niro and Joe Pesci are standing in the desert blaming each other for their problems never happened, but it is what happened. Uh, they never, you know, stood face to face and had a huge argument like that where Joe Pesci screams, you Jew, motherfucker, you and all these crazy things. Uh, but they blamed each other for what was happening. Uh, and, and I've always said the person that outlives everybody else is the most shrewd. Uh, Frank Lefty Rosenthal never said a thing. He went down to Florida and he died, I believe, in 2008, maybe 2000. No, I think it was 2008. Still a bookmaker, still an odds maker. He outlived them all. And he outlived them all because he played it safe. Uh, Believe me, if he had been skimming, they'd have killed him too. But I I do believe, looking back, that that bomb really wasn't done by Spilatro. I think that was the mob sending him a message, keep your fucking mouth shut. They took a shot, he lived, they let it go. Uh, That's the way the mob operates. Uh, but I think it makes for good storylines and good fodder with people trying to, to put that on, on Tony Spilatro. But at the end of the day, closest thing you're ever going to get to seeing Tony Spilatro in real life is probably the Joe Pesci character from Casino. But I think that there was more of a, a narrative of, of the affair in that film sort of pushing things along, where in reality, it, it was, you know, Frank Lefty Rosenthal, they put him out there for a reason. Uh, and Tony ends up going out there with one one main job. Just watch the guy, make sure things go well. But he can't just sit still and just make his money and do whatever. He's got to do 15 other things, which brings heat on to everybody. And if Tony Spilatro doesn't do those things, then Frank Culotto may not become a rat. And then the domino doesn't doesn't begin to fall. And so that's what's interesting. And, and that's what I want people to, to, to do listen to my show uh, to realize is if you're going to read about the history, see the domino when it starts to fall. It, it's never just one person. There's a domino effect that begins that affects a hundred. Uh, and so was Tony Spilatro a gangster? Absolutely. He was a tough guy. Absolutely. He was a maniac. Absolutely. But was he smart? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so that's sort of the life and uh, times of Tony Spilatro. Now, Here's what we got going on for next week. I am going to take a week off. uh, And then what we will do is come back the week after uh, with all new show, all new Q&A. In the meantime, just listen to all the old shows. And the only thing I ever ask you to do, like us, hate us, love us, whatever, uh, just share. Just share it once. You don't have to share it a million times. Just share it once. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Uh, Feel free to reach out. I, I try to answer I probably likely answer 150 messages a day, but I'm trying to get to everybody, but it just takes time. Uh, But any questions in the meantime, any concerns, any suggestions, you know where to send those. Give us a follow on Twitter at RealMobTalk7. Check us out on Facebook at MobTalkRadio. All that being said, I want everybody to have a great week, and we will be back 
probably a week from today. Uh, so not next Monday, but the following Monday. So it'll be probably two weeks out from now. But in the meantime, just listen to all the old shows. Uh, if you're curious about any subject that I've covered, you can easily go to Google, type in Mob Talk Radio and put a gangster's name. If I've done it, it'll come up. Or you can go over to YouTube, type in Mob Talk Radio, go down the video list. Uh, you can type in a name and, and it'll pull up. I've covered over 80 I think it's close to 80 guys at this point. So if I don't remember exactly who I've covered and when, there's a reason why. But all that being said, I wanted to thank everybody for listening in. And keep an eye out on Mob Talk Radio over on Facebook for the painting release. That's probably going to come like two weeks from now. Uh, any questions about that, you can send me a message personally. So all that being said, thanks for listening. And we'll see everybody in two weeks.